150 years ago, the theory of evolution found reception in the mind of Western man. It was not a new idea. It had been introduced in religious political documents in ancient Babylon and later in secular contemplations of developing Greece. Erasmus Darwin came up with the idea of natural selection as a mechanism for evolution. His grandson Charles introduced the concept to the secular academic community which was eager to embrace a non-theistic doctrine. This doctrine removed the need for a creator in the natural world and the need for accountability in the spiritual world. The text of this video series shows that evolution does not work in theory or in laboratory research. The evidence is heavily in favor of special creation. In this series of lectures, a complete creation model has been developed with extensive technical references. Prepare to have your mind dramatically expanded and your faith academically justified as our speaker, Dr. Carl Baugh, takes you on a fascinating journey from the microscopic to the galactic. Discover creation in symphony. Hello, I'm Carl Ball, director of Creation Evidences Museum in Glen Rose and director of International Expeditions looking for living dinosaurs. Welcome to the discussion today. We're going to discuss very intimate questions which have to do with your past, your present, and your future, and that of all of mankind. We're going to talk about dinosaurs, Tyrannosaurus rex, Pachycephalosaurus, Acrocanthosaurus, are there any dinosaurs still alive today? Recently our team arrived from an international expedition in the jungles of Papua New Guinea. We have over a dozen eyewitness accounts of creatures that for the world sound like in the description of those personal eyewitness accountants including pastors, educators, uh, school teachers, heads of clans, chieftains, uh, these creatures, according to those descriptions, for the world sound like rhamphorhynchoid pterodactyls with leather-like wings, reptiles with a beak, a crest, hands on their wings, uh, webbed feet. These creatures glow in the dark from their undersection. Often the tail glows in the dark. For you scholars in the audience, you'll recognize that a pterodactyl that has a tail would be a rhamphorhynchoid pterodactyl. Now according to the theory of evolution, which in the past I have believed and taught but do no longer believe nor teach, according to the theory of evolution, rhamphorhynchoid pterodactyls saw their demise 225 million years ago. Are they still around? Well, let's explore the issue. I'm glad you're here. By the way, how did you get here? Well, oh, I don't mean um, your mode of transportation, the vehicle in which you arrived. I mean, how did you get here? You as a person, living, breathing, thinking, reasoning, feeling, deciding, sensing all that's about you. How did you get here? That question is central to what makes us tick and all our future. It's central to our reasoning processes. The great philosophers of the centuries have asked that question along with three others. Every grandmother in this audience, every child, every granddad, every parent, every individual that has walked down sandy trails and jungles, every individual who has faced the asphalt jungles of modern civilization, Every philosopher and scientist has asked these four questions. These are the great questions of life. Number one, who am I? Who are you? Number two, how did I get here? That's the question I asked a moment ago. What brought me here? What are the life processes? Did I arrive by naturalistic circumstances with a fortunate combination of time, chance, and inanimate matter? Did the universe produce me in an evolutionary, naturalistic means? Or was I supernaturally created 
in the original proto form. How did I get here? Number three, what am I doing here? What's my purpose here? Number four, where am I going? All of these issues are germane to the issues of life. All people ask these questions. They might, may not phrase them in that particular phraseology, but all individuals worldwide have always asked these questions, and we're going to explore these questions and hopefully arrive at some plausible academic answers. This program examines life origins, comparison of life origins, evolution or creation. Who am I? How did I get here? What's my purpose here? And where am I going? We've been taught in this modern generation, and I have explored educational paths down dusty trails and distant lands and down jungle trails and sandy beaches. I've lectured in some of the major universities and some of the colleges of the world. I've lectured to private audiences. And I've been concerned about these questions. Life origins, comparison of life origins. There was a time when I personally thought humanistic and atheistic thoughts. There was a time when I believed and taught evolution. What changed my own thinking? Let's explore the issues. Is it possible for evolution to have occurred? Two of the world's great scholars, astrophysicists, Sir Frederick Hoyle, Ph.D., and Chandra Wickramasinghe, Ph.D., explored the issues recently with unlimited funding, unlimited access to the libraries and laboratories of the world, and uh, they wanted to know the answer to the question, is it possible for life to have originated somewhere in the universe or on planet Earth by naturalistic means? And that's illustrated in the Big Bang Theory, timeline of the universe, the naturalistic concept. And we have paraphrased that academically to show a moment of infinite temperature and inflation, an era of inflation. The documentation early, according to the postulate of humanist and astrophysicist who work in cosmology of gravity, a strong force, electromagnetic force, and a weak force. And then a time when the universe became transparent very early in the evolution of the universe according to standard evolutionary model. And then a time when galaxies and quasars began to appear and the current chaotic universe becoming self-realizing in the mind of man. What are the possibilities that this could occur. After spending more than a decade examining the issues and having at their disposal unlimited funding, unlimited access to the great libraries and laboratories of the world, Sir Frederick Hoyle and Chandra Wickramasinghe came to a conclusion. They stated that life originating in this universe or on planet Earth by naturalistic circumstances has one chance in 10 to the 40,000th power. Let me say that again. One chance in 10 to the 40,000th power. And then these two great scholars said, let's illustrate how impossible that is. They said it would be easier for a whirlwind to sweep through a junkyard and assemble a Boeing 747 jet in flight out the other end than it would be for life to have originated on planet Earth or in the universe by natural evolutionary means. Let me illustrate how large that number really is. One chance in 10 to the 40,000th power. You see, physicists tell us that in the entire universe, whether the universe began as an expression of the creativity of a personal God, or whether the universe began by naturalistic means, the sum total of data is identical. Now, according to the measurements and calculations of physicists, there are in the entire universe 10 to the 80th power of electrons. If we filled the entire universe with electrons, you know there's a lot of space out there, a lot of apparent nothingness, even though there are atoms and the space itself has a field of energy. 
But if we filled the entire space of the universe with electrons, which would be the smallest unit of measurable particle, if we filled it all, we would have 10 to the 130th power of electrons. Now, that means it would be easier for someone to mark a single electron, to blindfold a man, have him wander throughout the entire universe, give him one chance, one guess. He would have to accurately select that particular electron. It would be much easier for that to happen than for life to have originated by natural evolutionary means. Again, those figures are one chance in 10 to the 40,000th power. Now, these were not creationists and Christians and theologians analyzing the data. This was Sir Frederick Hoyle and Chandra Wickramasinghe, recognized internationally as great scholars. I have at my disposal the complete works of Charles Darwin. He's the hero of the evolutionary plot. I have the complete works of his bulldog, Huxley. I have some other works here representing atheistic thinking. And these are all at the disposal of our committee. By the way, at the Creation Evidences Museum, we have over 50 scholars, consultants, who travel from major universities or their own laboratories and uh, spend time in research with us. We're doing research that one of uh, NASA's engineers who helped design the most uh, successful experiment in space that NASA has biologically performed stated to the press that the research we're doing at the Creation Evidences Museum in low profile temporary facilities is more important than all the work he had ever done even for NASA. And I think before the program is over, if you'll stay with me, uh, you'll understand why this is so important. We're trying to solve the basic issues of life. Life origins. Is creation plausible? Is evolution plausible? Charles Darwin is the hero of the plot not because he had scientific data. Charles Darwin did some good work, not with the finches, that was compromised work, but he did some good work with earthworms and insects. However, he's the hero of the plot not because of his scientific achievement. He's the hero of the plot because he's the first man in history to have expressed verbally and publicly that his mind in its chaotic disposition was the chaotic universe finally self-realizing its own existence. Let me say that again. Charles Darwin had some major problems. He was phobic. He was a hypochondriac. He was a tormented man. Major complete volumes have been written about the torment of his life. He was chaotic. He uh, didn't like anything that smacked of design. He liked chaos because his own mind was in chaos, and he felt that his mind was the universe expressing itself in chaotic form. Now that is central to the evolutionary concept. Let me explain. We have a chart designed by our research encompassing more than 35 years and published scholastically by the Creation Evidences Museum, illustrating the theory of evolution. It begins with a Big Bang or a steady state thesis, either apply in this naturalistic state. It continues through the nebular hypothesis, which essentially means that debris from the Big Bang coalesced in the area of the solar system about 4.6 billion years ago, according to the evolutionary theory. Now, I've stated something quite important there. You see, according to the theory of evolution, life processes on planet Earth are the product of debris from a Big Bang. What that really means is subliminally, if we accept the naturalistic postulate of evolution, we're really the product of debris. We started as a piece of trash from an explosion. And these life processes continued in progression. Now, subliminally, that's important 
in the theory of evolution, that we began as debris, and then life organized itself. We'll talk about that a bit later. Finally, man arrived on the scene some 4.6 billion years after the coalition of debris from that explosion, but that's not the end of the story. According to the theory of evolution, these masses of stars, this solar system, will continue to expand out and out and out until it dies a heat death. Or, if there's enough mass in the universe to cause the universe to collapse back upon itself, then we'll die with a fiery explosion. Either way, there's no hope. Hopelessness is written into the very warp and woof of the concept of evolution. It's extremely important that I get that across. Hopelessness, despair. British philosopher Bertrand Russell spent a lifetime analyzing the chaos and the hopelessness of evolutionary naturalism. And he finally said, we must settle for unyielding despair. He said, all the high noon of genius, all the hopes of man, all the work of individual lives will ultimately collapse in a fiery explosion, the death of the solar system. And all that's left is unyielding despair. Well, I'd like to settle for a lot more than that. And I'd like to give you some hope. Will evolution work? According to these two great scholars, Sir Frederick Coyle and Chandra Wickrama Singh, it won't work. Let's take it further. The current modern theorist who has the attention of the entire world is Stephen Jay Gould of Harvard. In Natural History, he wrote not long ago, I regard the failure to find a clear vector of progress in life's history as the most puzzling fact of the fossil record. Another scholar, Professor L.B. Halsted, an atheist, wrote in Nature, there are no actual fossils directly antecedent to man, nothing directly linking us with the rest of the world. We've been taught academically that mutations have produced these ever-ascending spiral forms of life until finally here we are. But it just won't work. Again, Stephen Jay Gould of Harvard University and American Museum of Natural History wrote, a mutation doesn't produce major new raw material. It doesn't make a new species by mutating that species. That's a common idea people have, that evolution is due to random mutations. A mutation is not the cause of evolutionary change. And, end quote. Well, if it's not the cause of evolutionary change, what is the cause of evolutionary change? Punctuated equilibria is the current uh, school of thought, and it simply says, and Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge are the designers of this concept, that thought simply states that you can't really observe evolution occurring. Since there's no clear vector of progress, no clear line of ascent in the fossil record. You find individual life forms separate and distinct and functional. And since there's no clear line of ascent, evolution can't really be observed. It's off on the side. It occurs quickly by evolutionary standards, but it manifests itself in the mainstream as a new variation or new life form or ultimately a new species. Well, that's a very convenient thought You'll never find the evidence because it's hidden. But one leading evolutionary scholar admitted that his friends were absolutely sure that evolution was true if they could only find the evidence. It appears to me that the concept of evolution is really based on faith, not fact. In fact, I brought from the humanist January, February 1983 edition, Religion for a New Age, a statement. John J. Dunfrey wrote the following, I'm convinced that the battle for mankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their role as the proselytizers of a new faith. The current issue of the origin of species and the descent of man has an introduction written by a world-class scholar 
And he said, evolution is really a faith. It's a mindset. It's a way of looking at things. But Dunfrey continued a little further and he said, a religion of humanity that respects the spark of what theologians call divinity in every human being. These teachers must embody the same selfless dedication as the most rabid fundamentalist preachers, for they will be ministers of another sort, utilizing a classroom instead of a pulpit to convey humanist values in whatever subject they teach. Now, I want to point out something. There are very fine, well-meaning educators who assume that the theory of evolution and the concept of creation are really compatible. They assume that you can really hold to both. But leading humanists and evolutionists admit rather uh, readily that it isn't quite like that. In fact, their intentions are very clear. The classroom must and will become an arena of conflict between the old and the new. These are not my statements, but the statements published globally by the uh, Humanist Association. Conflict between the old and the new. The rotting corpse of Christianity, together with all its adjacent evils and misery, and the new faith of humanism resplendent in its promise of a world in which a never realizing Christian ideal of love thy neighbor will finally be achieved. That is the prospect. I think we need to recognize that the lines are clearly drawn. Now the question, will evolution work? In our research at the Creation Evidences Museum with scholars from major universities participating, we've uncovered some very startling evidence. I want to point out some of that evidence to you today. Now, in order for you to recognize the importance of this evidence, let me take you again to the chart which we have formulated. This chart expresses the concept of evolution as the evolutionists themselves desire it be expressed, beginning with the Big Bang, the nebular hypothesis of debris from that Big Bang coalescing in our solar system area, and then about 4.6 billion years ago, life got down to earnest. About 3.5 billion years ago, early bacteria evolved. About 5 150 million years ago, according to the evolutionary theory. Trilobites, Calamini trilobites evolved. Then about 250 million years ago, Lepidodendron, a plant that today is a club moss, reaching no more than 18 inches in stature, but found in the fossil record up to 120 feet tall, Lepidodendron, we excavated one at Glenrose with Nova filming over my shoulder during that excavation. About 250 million years ago, according to the evolutionary theory, Lepidodendron arrived. And then, about 228 million years ago, the dinosaurs arrived. About 100 million years ago, the dinosaurs at Glenrose roamed. Then about 6 million years ago, the great cats arrived. And finally, about 3.5 million years ago, man arrived and looked back on all of the evolving process and could appreciate it. Well, let me show you what we have excavated in original, in situ, academic excavation. In the very same rock stratum, the same layer, living at the same time originally, we excavated two trilobites. One was a calamini. Now, according to the theory of evolution, that trilobite lived a short time 550 million years ago. In the same layer, living at the same time, we excavated a big lepidodendron that, according to evolution, lived only 250 million years ago. So we've brought these tangible life forms from 550 million up to 250 million years of age. But it's better still. We excavated a big Acrocanthosaurus dinosaur. I have the privilege of being the discoverer of and the excavation of the largest Acrocanthosaurus and the most complete Acrocanthosaurus that ever lived, or at least that has been found so far. He looked a lot like Tyrannosaurus rex, except he had a Texas flare. He had spikes down his spinal column all the way near the tip of his tail. That's how he got his name, High Spined Lizard. And the one we excavated stood about 20 feet tall and 40 feet long. The curator of 
Dallas Museum of Natural History, came down to see some of the bones. I showed him one of the large vertebrae. He looked at me and he said, Dr. Ball, it is true then, Acrocanthosaurus was as large as any Tyrannosaurus rex that ever lived. So we excavated one. But now, he was found at Glenrose, and those rocks are assigned 100 million years in age. Watch closely what we've done. We've brought into one time frame life forms that supposedly lived 550 million years ago, up to live with life forms that supposedly lived 250 million years ago, up to life forms that supposedly lived 100 million years ago, but it gets better. In the very same rock layer, we excavated seven cat prints. I mean, Texas size cat prints. This is the Burdick print. We have the original of this cat print that has been sectioned. We can see the lamination pressure lines in it very conclusively. We excavated seven cat prints. This one is seven inches across at the flange. This cat would have stood about six feet at the shoulders. Now, according to the theory of evolution, the great cats didn't arrive until six million years ago, but we found that they lived simultaneous with the dinosaurs. Now, that certainly disrupts the evolutionary concept of things. Here we have the great cats in the same layer with the dinosaurs, with Lepidodendron, and with the trilobites. Finally, in the very same rock layer, we excavated 57 human footprints. How important is that? Two of the nation's leading evolutionary scholars, Drs. Milne and Schaefersman, admitted in Journal of Geological Education that if we could prove just that man and dinosaur lived contemporaneously, that would destroy the entire concept of evolution. Well, we've done a lot more than that. We've shown not only that man and dinosaur lived contemporaneously, but that the great cats, the lepidodendron plants, the trilobites all lived simultaneously. Let's examine some of this evidence. I brought to class, or to this discussion today, the original of the Burdick print. Now this footprint is 14 inches long. It's in a slab of rock, the original slab of rock that of course is much larger. If you examine it very closely, you'll see the ridges where it was chiseled out of the river. You'll see where they started to chisel much closer to the clothes when the toes when they marked their score line. Then they realized they were going to get too close to the flange and the little toe, so they marked the score line further out. Now this is 14 inches long. Someone in this audience might suggest that's too big to have been of human origin. Well, let me show you that just yesterday in the Dallas Morning News, there was an article showing the foot size of Lorenzo Williams of the Dallas Mavericks. And his foot size is 14 inches. His shoe is a little longer than 14 inches long. That shows that man certainly has the capability of making a print that large. I personally knew Max Palmer. Max Palmer stood eight feet, two inches tall. He died at age 56. At the museum, we have his coat and tie and the recording of his foot. Max, at 8'2", had a foot that was 15 and a half inches long, longer than the Burdick print. Just yesterday, one of my colleagues and I picked up the current issue of the Guinness Book of Records, 1995. This Guinness Book of Records states that Robert Wadlow of Alton, Illinois, stood 8, 11.1 inches tall. He died at a young age, by the way. His ultimate weight was 439 pounds. Robert Wadlow had a foot that was size 37 AA shoe. That was 18 and a half inches long. Well now, 18 and a half inches long would exceed the length of the entire piece of rock. 
Yes, it is possible for mankind to possess a foot as large as the depression here. Now, I'm not suggesting that all people have the capability, genetic capability, of possessing a foot that would make a track that size. But it certainly is within the realm of possibility for mankind. Is this a genuine footprint? We sectioned it. You can see the areas where it was sectioned. A very fine university some years ago sectioned in this area alone across the flange, assuming that the depression lines would show there better. However, in our research we found that man is very unique. Programmed from the brain, he walks in a unique fashion. He first plants his heel, he rocks the foot forward, planting the ball and the great toe in a lateral motion, and then he rocks the foot to the side, and then he depresses the toes in forward locomotion. That is a unique mannerism. It begins here, transfers there, there, and forward. That's a unique motion of mankind. Therefore, we knew we had to section across the heel to see if the greater pressure would be there because the initial pressure line certainly should be there. I brought for our discussion today photographs of the sectioned area, this immediate area. This is the actual footprint. There's no question that the clear lamination lines of pressure are shown. That is a genuine footprint. One leading evolutionary humanistic scholar in this area said, all right, you've shown that that's a clear human footprint. He had previously said uh, it uh, was a carving. He said, uh, obviously, that's a footprint, a genuine footprint. However, he said it's a dinosaur footprint on which someone has carved toes. He admitted that it was a genuine footprint because of the lamination pressure lines. Then we sectioned the forward area twice to make sure that the data was consistent. You can see we sectioned there and forward. In both lines, we found a very clear compression under the great toe. We found a dispersion of pressure, which is common when crystalline material is compressed with another indenture. We found under each of the toes indication that pressure had been applied. This is a genuine footprint. Do you understand the importance of this footprint? If we could prove that man and dinosaur lived contemporaneously with no precursors leading up, no life forms graduating to man, man and dinosaur living either in the distant past or the recent past, it would have the same devastating effect. But not only do we have human footprints, we excavated, by the way, seven of this exact stature, 14 inches in length. But we have some other things that I think you'd like to see. I brought with me today some treasures. First, the theory of evolution is taught consistently and academically around the world. We have in safety deposit a very rare and special fossil. This fossil is Hesperopithecus Harold Cookeye, commonly known as the Nebraska Man. Well, the Nebraska Man was used in the famous Scopes Evolution trial in Dayton, Tennessee by Clarence Darrow, who had behind him the scholarship of America's leading paleoanthropologist Henry Fairfield Osborne of Harvard University and American Museum of Natural History. And Dr. Henry Fairfield Osborne stated, this is the best evidence for evolution that we have on the American continents. He said, that clearly is graduation from an ape to a man. It's an ape graduating to a man. And if you look at it very closely, it certainly looks like a human molar, but not quite like a human molar. Uh, it looks like an ape's molar, but not quite like an ape's molar. So according to this great scholar in his day in 1925, uh, that's from an ape graduating, progressing, evolving to become a human being. Now, 
Because of that evidence in the trial, the day was ultimately won for evolution. Evolution was thereby introduced into the American public school system and ultimately into the school systems around the world, primarily because of the evidence of this fossil. It was 1925. The original discovery had been made in 1923. In 1926, Harold Cook, the geologist who made the original discovery, went back to western Nebraska, excavated in the same gravel pit, and found the rest of the skeleton, the rest of the teeth. In fact, this is one of the other teeth. This is not the tooth used at the trial or referred to at the trial, but this is from the very same jaw of the tooth used at the trial. Harold Cook went back to Nebraska, excavated, found the rest of the skeleton, including the jaws and the teeth, with one missing. He had the one that missed, and it fit perfectly. Now, I wonder, did it turn out to be an ape or a man or an ape man? None of the above. It turned out to be a pig, peccary. The admission was not made publicly until years later, and finally the admission was made that Hesperopithecus was found to be peccary. The average individual would have no idea what peccary would mean. Well, it simply means pig, an extinct pig. By the way, there is currently a variety of pig in one of the primitive areas of the world that produces a molar like that. That's from a pig. But the evolutionary concept continued. I brought some other things. I wanted you to get something from our discussion today. The question is, did we arrive by evolution or by creation? You've learned that leading scholars have admitted that evolution simply will not work but they say that's the only plausible explanation we have. Well, is it? Other leading scholars have admitted that if we could show that man and dinosaur lived contemporaneously, that would destroy the concept of evolution and verify that the entire thing had to be by direct creation. I brought a priceless artifact for you to see. This was excavated near Glenrose in the very same layer with the dinosaur footprints and the walnut shale, which is adjacent to the Comanche, which is adjacent to the Glenrose and Paluxy formations of limestone. I've had 20 different medical scholars analyze this fossil. It's priceless. It's a fossilized human finger. Notice the fingernail, the cuticle, the taper. Notice the medial joint. We sectioned it and found inside the replaced bone, the replaced cartilaginous ligaments, and the replaced epidermis, the skin, all perfectly preserved. I've had 20 different medical scholars analyze it. All 20 have confirmed that it is a human digit. From the medial joint forward, some have expertise to state that it is the fourth finger on the left hand of a girl. How do we know it came from a girl? There are two ways we can determine that. First, because of the taper. We men normally have a more blunt profile to the end of our finger. This is a more tapered profile. But look very closely. The back section of the replaced nail is flattened. Now, men do not produce flattened nails, but ladies, because of a beneficial bacterium, once every 28 days are susceptible to a flattening of the nails. Once every 28 days, a lady is susceptible to a beneficial bacterium that flattens the back portion of the nail. That's part of her metabolic profile. This is a human finger and a lady's finger. Now, there are other things about this which are quite interesting. It's slightly swollen, just slightly. And then it is slightly flattened. That would indicate to us a number of things. If you die by drowning, the metabolism of the human body inevitably causes that body to bloat and float. And if you're caught in a flood, then uh, you will have compression 
of the members of your body. Now, I have often been asked the question, is it possible for soft tissue to be preserved? It is. It is rare, but it's possible for soft tissue such as the fingernail, uh, the bone, cartilaginous ligaments, the epidermis, the skin to be preserved. And in proof of that, we have from safety deposit a worm, just a common earthworm. This earthworm was found near the museum in our excavations in Cretaceous layering. The same layering in which this track was excavated, the same layering in which uh, the finger was excavated. This is an earthworm. When I put water on the earthworm, even some of the pink pigmentation is still there. The band, the ring, is still intact. I've had very fine biologists examine it. There's no question that it is an earthworm. Well, if the soft tissue of a worm can be preserved, there should be no problem in the same conditions preserving a finger. But leading evolutionary scholars have said, all right, you have footprints. Those are somewhat subjective, even though man uniquely makes a footprint that is very distinctive. You have a human finger, but show us an actual man-made artifact to show that we're talking about intelligent man. We're talking about a prototype. In our opinion, those long ages are not there at all. In our opinion, the world before the flood in the equispheric balance, which we will discuss uh, shortly, that world before the flood in its equispheric balance would have produced the optimal genetic expression of living forms. And thus, they were intelligent people. I brought from safety deposit the real artifact, a very special artifact. It is the London artifact. It's a hammer, a man-made artifact. We're currently having wood from the handle, carbon dated, to give us a relative dating technique. Originally, it was found by Frank and Emma Hahn now deceased, as a concretion, completely encasing all of the artifact. They simply found in an area with adjacent material like it, they found a rock with a stick protruding from the rock. They took it home. Their son, who spent years as a professor at Ohio State University, chipped the top of it off and was amazed to find inside a man-made artifact. Now, this is six and a quarter inches in length. It's very sophisticated. It's octagonal in design, has an eye, even originally had a wedge inside the handle to keep it in place. Now, I took this hammer to Battelle Lab in Columbus, Ohio. That's the lab that analyzed the moonstones. Same lab, same technician, same instrument analyzed this as analyzed the original moonstones. We did a scanning electron microprobe elemental analysis and found that this artifact is 96.6% iron. That's very pure iron. 0.74% sulfur and 2.6% chlorine. That's mind boggling. Our best laboratories today, our finest minds, cannot compound iron with chlorine. Yet we have iron compounded with chlorine with a minimal amount of sulfur. And that's amazing. Whoever made this had to be a master artisan. We do not know if this was deposited in the worldwide flood or in the Peleg experience a few hundred years after the flood. We do not know when it was deposited, but we do know this. It was found and has been confirmed to have been within the same layer in which dinosaur footprints and dinosaur remains are found. Whenever this hammer was fabricated, dinosaurs were still around. And as we learned a few moments ago, pterodactyl dinosaurs probably are still around. Here's a part of the overlay material. Inside, you'll see a groove of the hammer. And this was a part of the material over the top of the artifact. Scholars came from global communities, according to the Hans, and each would want a little fragment that they had chipped off the top of this marvelous 
artifact, and ultimately nothing was left but the large portion with the secondary portion. I'm trying to say that man and dinosaur did live contemporaneously. Let me make another point which I think is extremely important. According to the theory of evolution, it took the granite 300 million years to crystallize. I want you to notice on this model done by world-famous artist Robert Summers, the granite as illustrated just below the surface on the planet, and this illustrates the original creation. And the granite, of course, underlies all the continents. Originally, it did underlie the uh, sea basins as well. According to the theory of evolution, it took that granite 300 million years to crystallize. I have with me a piece of granite. Dr. Robert Gentry is a world-class scholar, and Dr. Gentry has analyzed over 200,000 samples of granite worldwide. Some of these samples have been brought up from core drills deep in the crust of the earth. Some have been located on the surface of the earth as well. Now, inside this granite, you'll see little black flakes. These are normally called mica or biotite. This granite holds part of the answer to the question, how did we get here? You see, there are only two models. Leading evolutionary scholars have admitted the two models exhaust the possibilities. Either we were created by the direct fiat design of a personal creator, or we arrived by natural processes. Dr. Robert Gentry, with a microscope, looked inside this black mica or biotite. He found tiny little rings called pleochroic halos from the energy radiation from radioactive materials. Now the signature of these rings is very, very specific. And not only did he find the rings left by the decay of uranium, thorium, strontium, rubidi rubidium, potassium, argon, radioactive lead, PB-207, etc., but he found the rings left by the radioactive decay of polonium. Polonium-218, 210, and 214. Now, remember, the evolutionary concept is that it took 300 million years for this granite to crystallize. Yet at all depths, Dr. Gentry found in the granite these rings left by polonium. The half-life of polonium-218 is less than three minutes. Scholars in this audience will recognize that after seven half-lives of any radioactive material, all measurable amounts of that material have been exhausted. So you can only multiply by seven for the outside possibility of time duration. He found polonium-218 halos. Now, the half-life is less than three minutes. That means that in order to record that polonium-218 had been in the granite at all, this granite had to be crystallized, functional, and recording in less than three minutes. At the outside, 20 minutes, but it's better still. Dr. Gentry found at all levels in this mica, biotite, crystalline material inside the granite. The rings left by polonium-214. The half-life of polonium-214 is 0.0000 one six four seconds, 164 microseconds. All seven half-lives would be expended faster than I can snap my finger. That means that if you look at the data objectively, there is no possibility of long eons of time in the formation of the granite. It means this granite had to be functional and crystallized as a part of the design of the Creator in the original creation. Let's explore one other area before pausing briefly. Is there a possibility that living systems could have evolved? 
Dr. Robert Gange, with a Smarnoff Research Facility in Princeton, New Jersey, has taken the literature from microbiological laboratories and has found that evolution is absolutely impossible. And he illustrates it like this. Inside all material is information. For instance, inside the atom, even the hydrogen atom, there's an informational exchange between the electron, the proton, the neutron. There's an informational exchange. Dr. Gange takes the literature published by major scholars and major laboratories at major universities to show that you can take all of the natural information, the information in all of the natural inorganic materials of the entire planet Earth, and it comes out to be 160 bits of information. Now, 160 bits of information is a lot of information. Actually, 270 bits of information would be the equivalent of 10 to the 80th power. So that's a lot of information. All of the information and all of the natural elements of planet Earth put together, the inorganic elements, the entire globe, that information is 160 bits of information. Let's take the entire solar system, including the globe, our Earth, the Sun, eight other planets, asteroids, debris, etc., and it comes out to 170 bits of information. Let's take the entire universe. It comes out to be 235 bits of information. But now let's go to living material. Living material is another ball game entirely. Living material is extremely complicated. First of all, it's three-dimensional. Then every single component is interdependent and codependent on every other component. The smallest unit of living information we know anything about is a protein molecule. One protein molecule holds 1,500 bits of information. Now, did you get that? The entire universe of non-living material holds 235 bits of information, but one single non-replicating unit of living material, one protein molecule, holds 1,500 bits of information. What's the difference between 235 bits of information and 1,500 bits of information? Light years between. Now let's go to information that can produce a reproducing cell, a bacterium. A common bacterium is E. coli. E. coli is in the intestinal tract of every person watching this video at the moment. One single E. coli bacterium, just one, holds seven million bits of information. Now let's go to a human cell. One single human cell holds 20 billion bits of information. If the evolutionist wants his primordial soup pond with the right gases, energy system, and lightning strokes, give it to him. Give him an entire earth as a primordial soup pond. Give him the entire universe. Fill the universe with electrons and let the universe have his 15 billion years, 30 billion years. Give it an eternity of time for each electron to writhe, cohort, and experiment with every other electron in the entire universe. It is impossible for the entire universe, given an eternity of time, since it holds only 270 bits of information, to produce a single protein molecule, let alone a reproducing bacterium or ultimately a human cell. Watch this and we'll break. A book has been written recently by a major scholar in Australia, Michael Denton, Evolution, Theory, and Crisis. And Dr. Denton admitted, evolution just won't work. He's an evolutionist, but it just won't work. He said, for instance, in the cell, the DNA provides the information for the protein synthesis apparatus. Yet, it's that protein synthesis apparatus that provides the very proteins for the DNA to exist. That protein synthesis apparatus provides the protein phosphate compounds for the energy system. 
Yet the energy system of mitochondria, etc., provides the actual energy for the protein synthesis to function. That protein synthesis provides the proteins for the cell membrane, yet the membrane holds that entire synthesis apparatus intact. In other words, everything is interdependent and codependent on everything else. Evolution just won't work. In Lecture 1, we learn that evolution is not plausible. In Lecture 2, you will learn that design abounds in all the creation. From the very beginning of the creation, a marvelous design has been evident. All nature abounds with evidence of creation and a creator. Venture into this exciting realm with an open mind and a commitment to truth. Welcome back to segment two of Creation in Symphony. In the last session, we learned that evolution just won't work, admitted by major scholars in major scientific fields of discipline. But will creation work? How do the dinosaurs fit into the creation model? If everything is recent, why don't we have dinosaurs around anymore? Is there a worldwide flood experience recorded in the scientific data? What research avenue will give us some conclusive answers to this? Well, let's now consider the creation model in detail. I'd like to present to you Creation in Symphony, the complete model. The creation model is stated like this initially, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, the light he called day and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament, and let this firmament be separated from the waters above and the waters beneath. And God made the firmament and saw that it was good. The creation model answers so many problems. It begins like this, in the beginning, God. I will not in this lecture, nor any series of lectures or private conversation, attempt to define or prove the existence of God. As Werner von Braun, one of the greatest scientists of this century, stated, why do we need a candle to light the influence of the sun? God needs no proof. In the beginning, God existed. He always has existed. If I or any other speaker or communicator or scholar could give you proof of God, that would essentially mean academically that we would have created God or held the capacity to create God. We cannot create God. He created us. Therefore, I do not suggest a proof for God. I simply expose evidences that he does exist. In fact, I'd like to give you the statements of some of the leading scholars of the world in various areas of scientific discipline. British physicist H.S. Lipson said, Evolution became, in a sense, a scientific religion. Almost all scientists have accepted it, and many are prepared to bend their observations to fit it. To my mind, the theory of evolution does not stand up at all. He continued, I think, however, that we must go further than this and admit that the only acceptable explanation is creation. Now, if creation is the only academic explanation for what we see and feel and know and are, there had to be a creator behind that creation. Sir Frederick Hoyle stated, Observing the universe, I have to believe it's an intellectual structure I'm looking at, not mere chance. It's designed. It's orchestrated. Frank Tipler in an interview with Omni magazine just a few months ago stated, 
if you do a consistent physical analysis, God just falls out. Now, here's an atheist talking. Here's a scholar who has written various publications in leading journals regarding his atheism, but he has now done somewhat of an about face, and he stated, if you do a consistent physical analysis, God just falls out. He is there in an intrinsic, essential way, not just put in to cover our ignorance. And to that degree, I would agree with his statement. George Ellis, co-author with Stephen Hawking of The Large-Scale Structure of Space-Time, one of the world's great physicists and astrophysicists, stated, the construction of nature points to a purposeful designer. With that in mind, who is this designer? What is he like? We can observe the universe and find various factors in existence. For instance, there's limitless space, unending time, perpetual motion, unbounded variety, infinite complexity. Look further and you will find consciousness, feeling, will. You'll observe ethical values, religious values, beauty, justice, love, and life. No one could deny these entities exist. As Dr. Henry Morris pointed out, the first cause of limitless space has to be infinite in extent. The first cause of unending time must be eternal in duration. The first cause of perpetual motion must be omnipotent in power. The first cause of unbounded variety must be omnipresent in phenomena. The first cause of infinite complexity must be omniscient in intelligence. The first cause of consciousness must be personal. The first cause of feeling must be emotional. The first cause of will must be volitional. The first cause of ethical values must be moral. The first cause of religious values must be spiritual. The first cause of beauty must be aesthetic. The first cause of justice must be just. The first cause of love must be loving. The first cause of life must be living. My friend, I submit to you that the first cause of the universe, the designer of the entire universe, is the God of the Bible. There is no other plausible candidate. The God of the Bible is the God of creation. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Let's examine in some detail that concept. We have produced a chart under our auspices gleaning from background physical concepts of the evolutionary model on the bottom. Big Bang Theory or Steady State Theory all involve various areas of expression. And we have seen in the last lecture that that just won't work. Now let's see if creation will work. In the beginning, God. The God of the Bible is a God consistent with the universe that he designed. For instance, in the universe you find triplets. In human expression you find a response to triplets. In the Gettysburg Address, Abraham Lincoln used triplets, and that's one of the reasons it's permanently etched in the minds and attention of men worldwide through the centuries. Triplets in the Bible, for in, uh, triplets in the universe are observed. For instance, uh, you'll find energy, motion, and phenomena. You'll find time as past, present, and future. You'll find that the biblical concept of God and the logical concept of God is not one plus one plus one, but instead it's three in one, one times one times one. God the Father is the expression who lived eternally. God the Son is the eternal expression who had no beginning, will have no ending, but had a temporal expression in time. God the Holy Spirit is the expression of God in tangible, explicit form, 
to the creation as such by influence. So you have one times one times one, God the Father, manifesting God the Son, who sent forth and influences you through the Holy Spirit. In the beginning, God created. The biblical record states that all things were made by Jesus Christ, and all things consist by him. Thus, we have a likeness of Christ expressed as the primary author in the creation event. And that's logical and consistent. Please understand, we're not making a likeness of any God to worship. We're giving an expression that's logical. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, that's quite consistent with scientific research. The heaven is a plural singular in the Hebrew. It essentially means the space-time dimension. It's a field of expression involving time, involving energy, involving an actual dimension, the space-time dimension, the background universe. In the beginning, God created the heaven, that space-time dimension, and the earth. But this earth was created as a sphere of water on day number one. Some activities were manifest of God on day number two, three, four, five, and six. And then on day number seven, God rested. Not because he was tired, but God rested because he was finished. Each day is a literal solar day. More about that in a moment. There was a time when I believed that these were eons of time, even in the biblical Christian mosaic of creation. But academically, it's impossible for these to be eons of time. These have to be literal time dimension expressions. For instance, the earth has a magnetic field. That magnetic field is losing its energy exponentially. In 1835, Carl Gauss of Germany, for the first time in history, measured the Earth's geomagnetic field. In 1839, he began to measure it regularly, measured it the rest of his life. After his life, others took up the task, and we have 140 years of data in the U.S. Publishing Office, Washington, D.C., giving the actual calculations, historical calculations, of the strength or moment of the Earth's magnetic field, geomagnetic field. Now, Dr. Thomas Barnes, who at that time was head of the physics department, University of Texas at El Paso, took these data and put them in the computer, and he found that not only is the magnetic field of the Earth losing its intensity and extending its lines because it's limber, it's more loose, it has lost its energy. Others had certainly observed that we were losing the energy. But Dr. Barnes put these data in the computer and he found that we're losing this energy exponentially. Now that's extremely significant. That gave him a handle on how strong the field was in the past. Now, the strength of that field in the past, every seven to 1400 years, doubles according to these calculations and with an exponential decay. That means that if you double it every few hundred years, if you go back as far as 10,000 years ago, doubling it every few hundred years, the intensity of the Earth's magnetic field would have been so powerful that enzymes necessary for life processes and enzymes inside the functioning cell could not have held together due to the intensity of that energy. If you go back as far as 15 to 20,000 years ago, the energy of the Earth's geomagnetic field would have approximated that of a magnetic star, and many of the atoms in planet Earth could not have held together. I'm simply saying to you in the audience, that the earth is young, the entire system is young. And further in this lecture, we'll talk about the orchestrated design of that entire creation. In the beginning, God created the heaven, that's the space-time dimension, and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. It was a sphere of water. And God said, let there be light. Is that consistent with scientific research? Leading physicists have admitted that in the beginning, 
there was light, and that that light possessed the radiant energy to be transformed into atoms and suns and stars, and ultimately into life processes itself. It all began as light. In the beginning, God created the heaven, space-time dimension, and the earth as a sphere of water, and then said, let there be light. We come to another question. If God created the space-time dimension and then planted earth as a sphere of water, how is that consistent with bringing forth light? Recently, Scientific American, February 1995, issued an article of major import. Scholars at UCLA found a very special phenomena or phenomenon expressed in various phenomena, plural. They found that when water, pure water, has a vibratory encapsulization of a space, we would call that a bubble, that the vibratory expression, sound, causes that bubble to collapse to the point where it reaches 100,000 degrees Fahrenheit in temperature and actually burst forth as light. They call this sonoluminescence. They've actually recorded the entire spectra of this light. Here we have the time expression. Here we have the bubble radius expression in microns. We have the height of the bubble, the collapse of the bubble, and then we have its ultimate total collapse. We have the sine wave or sound wave, which is in a sine wave expression. The sound wave is simply the entrance of sound introduced uh, but through a recorder for them. And then the actual light expressed in the laboratory at UCLA and reported in Scientific American February 1995. You'll find the long wave expressed, the visible expression, visible light. Most of the light was in the ultraviolet short wave range with a tremendous amount of power. Once again, I want you to see an actual bubble of light generated just by sound. I'm saying that this step in the creation model is very plausible, scientifically plausible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, originally as a sphere of water on day number one, and God said, let there be light. He had his own energy of sound, capability of creation, and a source of water from which to create the light if that was his design. I'm not saying that God the Creator, in the person of Jesus Christ, used the water of the earth from which to create the light, but I'm saying that scientifically that has been found plausible. And the next statement of the creation model is, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. We have illustrated this first on day number one, there was simply a sphere of water. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Water is a very unique compound. Hydrogen and oxygen. H2O, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. It has very unique characteristics. It's dipole. It has its own little magnetic field. It has its orientation north and south or negative and positive. It is a molecular combination which actually in physics means that the two elements hydrogen and oxygen could be transmuted ultimately to provide all of the elements we find in the entire spectra of elements here and throughout the universe. Water with hydrogen can transmute the early elements. Oxygen can be transmuted to the higher elements. There's a barrier between seven and eight in physics. You scholars will understand what I'm talking about. But in the creation model, that's already solved by the creation of oxygen along with hydrogen on day number one. Water has a unique characteristic in that it operates in a random order. The molecules operate each independently. They don't line up. But again, back to the creation model. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. 
And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Any time the Spirit of God moves upon anyone or anything, he aligns the object upon which or the person over whom he is moving. If it's an object of water, a sphere of water, the alignment does something very special. I already mentioned that water is dipole, that is positive and negative. It has its own little magnetic field or electromagnetic field. If you add energy sufficient to align the entire sphere of water, then the entire mass takes upon itself an electromagnetic field consistent with the strength of the total amount of fields in the water. Did you get that? Simply by aligning the water, the Spirit of God would have automatically generated a magnetic field around that sphere of water. That magnetic field is extremely important. The Earth's geomagnetic field is actually essential for life processes. What I'm suggesting to you is that in his marvelous design, the creator of the universe had the answer before we had the problem. An outstanding Russian scholar and an American scholar, Robert O. Becker, Nobel candidate, have collectively provided some impeccable data to show that all biological systems function on the energy of the Earth's magnetic field, electromagnetic field, geomagnetic field. The cellular information, the exchange of information on the cellular level is both chemical and electromagnetic. One reason today we have a decay in episodes of life and function of life is that we are losing the strength in that magnetic field. Watch very closely. Without that field in sufficient strength, we don't have sufficient chemical and electromagnetic communication on a cellular level. A high school student, a junior high school student, suggested to NASA that they do a very important experiment. He suggested 64 fertilized hen eggs, just chicken eggs. And he suggested that he keep 32 of those in a control and send 32 of those out into space on the shuttle. He suggested that two eggs on Earth and two eggs sent out with a shuttle be fertilized just a couple of days. And incrementally, the rest of the eggs in pairs would be fertilized various numbers of days. They did that. They had the 32 on Earth in a control chamber. They had the 32 sent out into space above the influence of the surface geomagnetic field. That's extremely important. Above the influence, direct influence of gravity, but more importantly, above the surface influence of the Earth's magnetic field. When they brought them back, all eggs that were in the control chamber on planet Earth hatched. All eggs that were sent out into space hatched except the two eggs that had only been fertilized, had only been laid two days. They'd only had two days of Earth's magnetic field influence in mitosis. The others had a number of days later, four, eight, 16, etc., all the way up to incubation time. Now, that means that mitosis in division of the cell to function properly requires the Earth's magnetic field. On day number two, on day number one, as the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, that magnetic field was formed. That also provided a basis for day number three. This day is one of my most intriguing areas of research. Back to the creation model. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, space-time dimension, and the earth as a sphere of water. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. The light he called day, and the darkness he called night. That means the sphere of water was in motion with a regular rotation. 
Verse number six of Genesis chapter one states, and God said, let there be a firmament. We've expressed this firmament with this model done by the world famous artist Robert Summers. And this firmament is expressed as a bubble of water over the surface of the earth. Remember that at the time this firmament was built on day number two, we did not have the continents yet, we did not have the dry land, all of that's day number three. But let's get to day number two. We have illustrated this in vivid detail. Now the word for that firmament is rakia in the Hebrew. It's a very special word. The word for firmament means to compress, pound together, and stretch out this arch of heaven in thin metal sheets. <laughs> metal sheets? That through us. That through scholars worldwide. Researcher Dan Cook called and uh, said, I understand you're doing research on the world before Noah's flood. I said, that's correct. He said, I have spent over 20 years in major laboratories preoccupied with the question about the world before Noah's flood. And he said, after years and decades of research, he said, I know what metal was in that firmament. And I said by long distance telephone, uh, Dan, now wait a minute, was there real metal in that firmament? And he said, that's what the Hebrew word means. And I said, I understand that. It is rakia. It means to compress, pound together, and stretch out this arc of heaven, or arch of heaven, in thin metal sheets. But I said, uh, that I've taken to be figurative. He said, it won't work figuratively. He said, unless it's literal, you can't keep it in suspension. It won't work figuratively. I said, all right, I'm listening. I said, no, wait a minute, you've got a problem. Because on day number four, the light of day one was coalesced into star bodies, the sun, the moon, the greater light ruling the day and the lesser light ruling the night, and the influence of the stars were all felt, and the biblical record states that God set those stars, and uh, you could see them more brightly and more vividly and in better color than we can today. If you have a metal vault, you're not going to be able to see the sunlight or the starlight or the light of the moon reflected and coming in. He said, wait a minute, don't you know that most metals in their pure state are transparent? I said, I wasn't aware of that. He said, don't you remember that when our astronauts walked on the surface of the moon, the visors of their helmets actually contained a thin coating of gold, pure gold, micro-thin, and it was transparent. They could look out on the surface of the moon and actually see all the details in vivid relief. I said, that's amazing. You can look through pure gold. He said, that's right. He said, that's not all. I know what metal was in this firmament. He later came to the museum and reiterated that at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories, they had done some experiments with the elements of water. Now remember, at that point in time, in creation, we only had the space-time dimension, the field of energy, and the tangible water in a spherical mass as planet Earth. That was all day number one. But on day number two, again, you simply had the water in tangible form. So Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories took the elements of water inadvertently. They compressed them. Now remember the word rekia means to compress and pound together. They compressed them and added energy. The water molecules of oxygen simply turned blue. But when they got to the hydrogen, they found a very special thing. The hydrogen, when compressed with energy added under super cold cryogenic circumstances, the hydrogen bonded into a crystalline lattice took upon itself a very unique form in crystalline lattice, was first transparent, later became opaque. Other laboratories followed up, and what we've enlarged here is a very small section of an experiment. This is actually one trillionth of a cubic inch of space encompassed, and we've enlarged it here. You'll see the actual photograph here. The lab photo shows the dark areas as hydrogen 
taking on a metallic context. The lighter areas show hydrogen in crystalline form, metallic hydrogen, but transparent. The transparent area veins are not superconductive, but the opaque area is actually superconductive. Now, we're not talking about a wide band in this firmament. Probably, at most, just a few inches thick. That's all that's necessary. And superconductivity is a very special phenomenon. When the hydrogen became opaque, you could not see through it, but it became opaque simply in veins. The entire structure did not become opaque. That still leaves the channels for the light to stream directly through because the vast bulk of the material is crystalline hydrogen in a transparent form, metallic but transparent. But the superconductive material, metallic hydrogen, does a very special job. I have a photo here from NASA, and I'd like to show you this photo that uh, has made the front page issue of one of NASA's briefs. Here is a superconductive material at fingertip. Here is a magnet. And remember, the Earth has a magnetic field. The Earth is one giant magnet. Here you have the magnet suspended above the superconductive material, or you can do it the other way with no difficulty. It'll hang at the bottom, or the superconductive material will suspend above the magnet. Now, that's amazing. That means that this thin layer of bonded metallic hydrogen, superconductive in veins, tiny veins, transparent in the rest of the material, would actually hold the firmament in suspension above the earth. Now that answers so many, many problems. There is a gentle glow that hydrogen bears when it is energized. I brought today a very special instrument. I brought a supply of electrical energy, and I brought a little tube, a little flask, with hydrogen. And we want to turn this hydro the energy on to energize the hydrogen and it glows a very special color. As we turn the energy on, I want you to notice the special color that hydrogen glows. It's pink. Technically, it's 63-65 angstrom magenta. That's pink. Notice the oxygen also is glowing blue, but in the center area, the compressed area, the hydrogen overpowers the blue of the oxygen, and thus you get a pink color. Now, you have seen that pink color at sunrise and often at sunset. Just before sunrise, you see a glow of pink. The basic reason you see that glow of pink is that the water molecules are charged by the consistent, lower-level, intense rays of the sun's energy. When they're charged, the blue is seen from the oxygen radiation, but the magenta pink of the hydrogen overpowers the blue for just those few moments because you have intense energy field lines, and you see pink. At sunset, you see some of that color, but it's contaminated by dust particles in the atmosphere. What I'm suggesting is that there was a gentle pinkish glow in that crystalline firmament. I have a pair of pink glasses. I wore them to the studio today. Any moment I get in the car, automatically, before I turn the switch on, I put my pink glasses on. An amazing thing happens. Research indicates that when you look through pink or look at pink, and it has to be the right level of pink, when you look at the right level of pink, or 63, 65 angstrom magenta, your brain generates norepinephrine. That's a neurotransmitter. 
a number of individuals at the museum have put on these glasses and have had their dyslexia altered to some degree because of the neuron transmission problem. Now, I'm not claiming a pharmaceutical or physical benefit. I'm simply saying that it's very interesting to see the benefits. Recently, I had a psychiatrist call and she said, my associate, she said, we're publishing psychiatrist, and my associate uh, has an attention deficit syndrome problem. And he has to be on heavy medication, and that, of course, to some degree, diminishes our practice and our ability to publish. And she said he saw one of your tapes or read one of your books about the pink glasses. He ordered a pair of pink glasses. And after just a couple of days of wearing those, he threw away his medication. Now, I'm not suggesting that you throw away your medication. I'm not claiming any benefits at all. I'm simply saying that it's very interesting to note that a number of people, simply by looking through pink, have had a marvelous transformation to some degree in their impairment. Now, let's solve another problem. I put on these glasses and the world does not look pink. In fact, the blue lines strike in front of the retina, but the red lines strike directly on the retina and actually colors are enhanced looking through these pink glasses. The world is a more vivid, brighter place to live. So I'm saying that before the flood, the world didn't have a pinkish cast. The sky had a gentle pinkish cast. And it probably had that cast of pink dominating through the morning hours. It would uh, change at high noon probably to a much lighter pink and then deepen in the evening hours. And incidentally, watch closely. Research found that not only did that hydrogen in its transparent form transmit all the spectra of light so that you got all of the intense colors coming right through all the visible colors, but it filtered out the short wave radiation and it became fiber optic. That is, it transferred the energy of this light throughout the firmament. What this means is the sunlight of day shining on the day side of the earth in the firmament actually had its light transferred diminishingly to the night side, which means when the scripture states that the greater light, the sun, rule the day, and the lesser light rule the night, that certainly involved the moon, but it involved more than the moon. It involved the transfer of energy from the day side through this fiber optic firmamental canopy to the night side as well. That means that in all probability before the flood, there was no midnight darkness. That meant that dusk, which is one of our very finest times of the 24-hour cycle, actually had the ambient glow carried all night long. That meant that the stars would be seen in more vivid detail because the red filter was built in so the full color of the stars could be seen. But that means you had no midnight darkness. At midnight, it probably was about like the ambient dusk of day in intensity of light. It's quite natural that an infant is afraid of the dark once they're able to see. It's quite natural that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. It's quite natural that light is beneficial. So the greater light rule the day and the lesser light rule the night. That lesser light, again, certainly was the moon, but it also, I believe, involved transfer of light fiber optically through that canopy. Now, I said a moment ago this would solve a lot of major problems. It certainly would. Our research has indicated that once the creation week was complete, this bubble of water, water above, water beneath, and just a very thin film with hydrogen structurally interlaminated within that water, crystalline hydrogen, in thin veins that were opaque, but more normal veins that were transparent, assimilating the light, also assimilated the short wave energy. This solves a major 
problem. Creationists have advisedly pointed out that if we were to go back with the intensity of the Earth's magnetic field decreasing exponentially every few hundred years, if we were to extrapolate back in time between 15 and 20,000 years ago, the intensity of that field would run off the chart. The Earth's magnetic field would have the intensity of a magnetic star, and that is totally implausible. Life systems could not function. They could not function even 10,000 years ago. So we're talking about a very brief period of time in Earth history, like between six and 7,000 years ago. Recently, I received a fax, handwritten, and I've learned through the years to read the signature of a letter before reading the letter. I want to know who's speaking. And uh, at the bottom of the fax, handwritten, it said, Dr. David Otway Ray, W-R-A-Y, the next line said, Senior Academician, Academy of Sciences, USSR. The next four lines listed academies of science in the Eastern Bloc nations where he was a member. So I decided I'd better read that letter. I glanced up at the top and he began, handwritten. Dear Dr. Ball, I saw you speak on satellite television and I agree with your model. I can fill missing areas in that model. Well, I decided I better read the letter. In the letter he said, I'm lecturing, I'm on sabbatical in the United States, I'm lecturing and he named the particular university and said, please contact me. And he gave the telephone number at the home where he was staying. It was about three days before my schedule permitted any lengthy conversation, so I called him after three days. And he said, I've been waiting up for you to call all this time. And I was sorry to have inconvenienced him. And he said, I want you to know that your model works. I said, all right, what's your background? He said, I work in quantum algebra. He said, there are only a handful of scholars who work in this discipline. And he said, I began as an atheist, you can understand, because all scholars in Russia at that time were atheists. And he said, I knew the Bible could not be true. I knew there could not be a personal God and a creator of the universe. And I had the academic background to prove that statistically. So he said, I took the statements of the book of Genesis and I put them into the algebraic form. And he said, the formula that I worked out covering all the broad spectra took eight pages to work out. I took it to my colleagues and I said, check this. The colleagues checked and said, well, the formula's right. The math is right. We just don't like the results you found. Go back and work it again. He went back and it came out the same way and he had them check it again. And he said, they did, couldn't, dis couldn't disagree with the math, but they disagreed with the final results. And I said, what were your results? And he said, what I found was, with impeccable mathematic scrutiny, that the universe is just a few thousand years old. I said, Dr. Ray, how many thousands of years old? He said, between six and 10,000 years. That's all the leeway I could get out of the formula and out of the math. And he said, I realize that if the universe is that young, the entire universe, not just planet Earth. If the universe is that young, then it had to be designed, it had to be created. And I knew there was only one plausible creator, and that was the creator of the Bible. And I knew I had to read the Bible, and I had to get right with that creator. I said, did you do it? He said, yes, I want you to know that I found that there's only one plausible way to know that creator, and that's through the person the expression of himself, the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And he said, I now know Jesus Christ as my personal savior. That is a tremendous testimony from a world-class scholar. Now, back to the point in the last moments of this lecture. This model that I'm proposing to you, creation in symphony, answers major problems. Creation scholars such as Dr. Russell Humphreys, Dr. Thomas Barnes, other outstanding creation scholars have certainly been right 
in concluding that whether the decay is a free decay or dynamic decay, it all shows that the decay has been exponential. And that decay of the Earth's magnetic field means that creation was just a short time in the past, between six and 7,000 years ago. But until this model, and exclusively held in this model, until this model, we had not addressed another major issue. If the Creator designed the creation just a few thousand years ago, with the Earth's magnetic field decaying exponentially, which to this point is all that has been addressed, that means that there was an interdiction at the time of the flood, disrupting that, a slight buildup around the time of Christ's visit to Earth, and that's quite astounding. Uh, the uh, magnetism in the rock showed it was a little stronger. Uh, 2,000 years ago, it had been weaker previously, it had dipped, it was stronger, it continued to exponentially decay. There have been some interdictions with this, there have been some convulsions, but the problem is this. If the Earth's magnetic field began with an exponential decay, showing that it was created recently, that means that the Creator wrote into the formula a decay that in a very short period of time would disrupt the optimal expression of the life forms. For both in Russia and the United States, Scholars have found that living systems depend on the strength of that magnetic field. In fact, it is so low in intensity at this point that effective cellular communication is disrupted and is insufficient. However, our model, Creation and Symphony, addresses the issue like this. It addresses the issue from a standpoint that involves your personal life and well-being. That means that on day number two, as the firmament was created, it began to assemble the short wave energy into the very firmament itself and subsequently to share that energy with the Earth's magnetic field on which that firmament rode, suspended with superconductive levitation. That being the case, that means that it was constantly re-energized as we living systems used its energy. You see, there are no free lunches. As we use the energy, something has to pay for that energy. Thus, the orchestral creation model, creation in symphony, shows that the balance of all of the energy from all the stellar bodies, the stars, the sun, the moon, reflection from other planets, constellations and galaxies at a great distance, all actually intervened and contributed for the life of man. That is astounding. The life of man, in the next session, we'll talk about the anthropic principle. Was the creation, was the universe designed for the benefit of man? Evidence in physics shows that it certainly was. With this model, the canopy of the earth assimilated the light, the shortwave radiation, filtered out that shortwave radiation so that we would not have decay from ultraviolet radiation. It kept that charge intact. But at the time of the flood, later at the time of Peleg, we had disruptions and we have an exponential decay. More about that in later lectures. This also solves the problem of carbon-14. Any time a bone is found, any time an artifact is found, the press very rapidly announces there was a carbon dating done on it, very little carbon was in it, therefore that means that it's extremely old. Our position is that the Earth system and the entire universe is quite young, just thousands of years in age. Watch this. The basic ultraviolet radiation which comes in to us today is a problem for us. Cancer is generated on the surface of the skin by mutational damaging change. But it also does something else. 
We lost that bubble. We lost that firmament at the time of the flood. It collapsed. And the system to re-energize the Earth's magnetic field collapsed along with it. Subsequently, over a period of centuries, we lost the suspension of water molecules in the upper atmosphere to such a degree that ultraviolet radiation streams in at an alarming rate. Not only does that ultraviolet radiation harm living systems by generating cancer, by generating free radicals, we ingest those free radicals, they bond to the cellular structure, even to the DNA, radicalized oxygen is a major problem. It bonds to almost any chemical agent it comes in contact with. We ingest all of that and we're damaging ourselves to a major degree. We don't have that firmamental canopy any longer. But it also did something else. The loss of that canopy and the influx of ultraviolet radiation charges particles in the upper atmosphere. This charge of particles causes an actual neutron to be emitted, it's assimilated by nitrogen-14 in the upper atmosphere. In turn, nitrogen-14 expels uh, an electron or photons, and in the process, it transmutes to carbon-14. Carbon-14 is not normal in the life chain. Carbon-12 and carbon-13 are normal in the life chain. Carbon-14 is radioactive. The principle is if you find uh, after 5,600 years or so, carbon-14 having lost half its mass, if you find something with very little carbon-14, that means it's been around a long time. Not so. Since we know the firmament was there in the creation model, since we know it would have filtered out the ultraviolet radiation, that means the primary generation of carbon-14 would have not been functional at all. That means that if you find something with very little carbon-14, it simply means it was deposited approximately at the time of Noah's flood. It does not mean it was extremely old at all. The creation model answers so many problems, and in the next session, we'll get closer to home. Much more is waiting to be explored. Don't miss our next journey into the music of the spheres. All living organisms are intimately connected to the energy waves of the universe. Our Creator designed a symphonic relationship between these organisms, light, and the energy fields of nature. We are encompassed by this symphony of harmony. Welcome back to Session 3, Creation in Symphony. In the last session, we talked about days 1 and 2 of creation in the creation model. In the first session, we learned that evolution just won't work. In fact, Wolfgang Smith, Ph.D., physicist and mathematician, recently wrote in a globally respected journal, a growing number of respectable scientists are defecting from the evolutionist camp. Moreover, for the most part, these experts have abandoned Darwinism, not on the basis of religious faith or biblical persuasions, but on strictly scientific grounds. There is a basis lacking for evolutionary plausibility. There is a basis that is solidly entrenched in scientific research supporting the creation model. Yesterday, or in the last session, we talked about a firmamental canopy above the globe created on day number two. This is called the rakia in the original Hebrew language. I brought to the session today a photograph taken recently and I believe displayed in Discover magazine, which shows that today there is a buildup of ice particles 50 miles above the globe. These ice particles are consistent in large sheet layers. And what this really shows is that in certain areas of the magnetic field, there can be a natural occurrence of sheets and layers of ice that can be radiating the glow of planetary structures and the glow of the sun. 
Now, you'll remember I spoke in the last session about the fact that we're losing the strength of the geomagnetic field. Physicists have found that when a field is strengthened, it pinches or has a radius that is much tighter. Well, in the current situation where we do not have a recharged context with a cosmic energy lacking in recharging the magnetic field because we are lacking the firmamental canopy above that field, we do not have the recharge mechanism, so these lines of force have loosened or broadened out. Today they extend 40,000 miles out into space. However, during a period of solar flares or sunspots, that additional cosmic energy causes these lines to concentrate. What this shows is cosmic energy does share a recharging of the Earth's magnetic field if there is a mechanism to keep it in place. And 50 miles above the Earth, there is at least a limber, low moment, low energy field or line of flux sufficient to hold some of these ice particles in place. Now, I spoke also in the last session about the fact that there is a design in the universe suitable for man. Let's dwell on that from the academic standpoint. During recent years, physicists have been preoccupied with a concept that is extremely interesting. And the concept is this. The universe is so spaced and so designed from the proton, the electron, the nucleus, the energy of the atom, the individual atoms themselves, the effect of star bodies, including our solar system with its planets and sun, the effect of all of the marshaled unit of the universe, all designed for some reason with man in mind. It's called the anthropic principle. Evolutionists are adrift today on how to explain how all of this could have happened. In fact, the best explanation they have is we live in a very fortunate window of the evolution of the universe where the uh, separation, cosmic separation of star bodies and star clusters and the shells of star clusters are just right. Space is sufficiently large. The solar system has evolved to an intricate point with refinement to the degree of 10 to the 55th power in precision so that currently in this very fortunate window man can evolve and survive. Well, that's very interesting. It's very convenient to say it's fortunate at this moment. A far more plausible explanation, a far more academic explanation is to realize that the entire universe was created for the benefit of the man that is looking at this video at this moment. You were in mind in the Creator's design. Let me express this from various scholars. Physicist Rees and Carr in Nature magazine, a very highly respected scientific journal globally published, wrote an article called The Anthropic Principle and the Structure of the Physical Universe. Now, anthropos has to do with man. That's the Greek for man. The anthropic principle and the very structure of the universe. Class, what I'm really trying to say is this universe, from the microcosm to the macrocosm, from the very tiny to the extremely enlarged, has all been designed with you in mind. Now, here's what these physicists found. They calculated the mass of the cosmos, from the atom to the entire universe, and they found that the size of planet Earth is a geometric mean, an average, a unit, a geometric mean of the size of the entire universe. Let me say that again. They found that the size, mass, and volume of the Earth is a direct geometric mean to the size of the universe. So planet Earth figures into this prominently. They also found that the mass of the human body is a geometric mean of the mass of the proton and the planet itself. So this means that it's not the cats and the canaries as delightful as they are. 
It's not the reeds and the palms and the ferns, as delightful as they are, but the entire universe and planet Earth and man have an infrastructure of design. Also the reeds and the ferns and the insects and the birds all figure into this design, but for the benefit of man. They found that these proportions further relate to the electromagnetic and gravitational constants. They're not simply physical particles themselves exclusively. Well, it looks like this universe was designed for man. And that is the principle of creation in symphony, the composite creation model. In the last session, I talked about the fact that on day number two, the creator said, let there be a firmament. And he designed above the earth this very thin, transparent for the most means, for the most part, transparent fiber optic, superconductive canopy above the earth. That canopy would have kept the atmospheric gases in place, and those atmospheric gases were provided on day number three. We do not have that canopy today, and we are the worse off for not having that canopy today. In fact, one of our consultants, Dale Peterson, MD, uh, wrote a very fine scholastic research project called Longevity and the Biblical Record. And he said, excess-free radicals attach themselves to cell membranes. Now, let's go back a step. In the last session, we learned that as the ultraviolet radiation penetrates through the atmosphere down to surface Earth, it excites the oxygen molecules and other molecules as well, but primarily oxygen is a, a very uh, radical agent when charged by ultraviolet radiation. It excites that, free radicalizes the oxygen molecule and others so that we ingest those and we're being contaminated. In fact, Dr. Peterson, who is on faculty, adjunct faculty, University of Oklahoma School of Medicine, former faculty member at Wisconsin School of Medicine, uh, has written, excess free radicals generated by this lack of the canopy attach themselves to cell membranes LDL cholesterol, and even DNA. They penetrate right inside the cell membrane. Damage done to the human body is enormous. The list of conditions felt to be caused by or aggravated by free radicals includes arteriosclerosis, Alzheimer's, cancer, high blood pressure, schizophrenia, Parkinson's disease, Down syndrome, strokes, cataracts, arthritis, emphysema, dandruff, wrinkles, memory loss, mental sluggishness, over 60 disease states are felt by a number of researchers to be caused by or aggravated by these free radicals. Now, prior to the flood, when we lost that canopy, those free radicals would not be generated because the ultraviolet radiation would be trapped along with other shortwave radiation, thus energizing the geomagnetic field and not penetrating for the detriment of man. This session will have to do with day three and day four of creation in an orchestrated design or creation in symphony. A friend of mine, Paul Taylor, has written a splendid book, Illustrated Origin Answers, and he has listed 102 academic processes showing the earth to be very young. I would recommend that you get that particular book by Paul Taylor. We're talking about days of creation and a recent creation. John Morris, very fine friend of the museum and of creation research worldwide, published a book recently called The Young Earth. I recommend you get The Young Earth by John Morris. In The Young Earth, this very fine scholar asked the question, how long is a day? The Hebrew word yom is the word translated day from the Old Testament. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, the light he called day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. How long was that day? Dr. Morris points out that there are various ways that the word day can be used as a solar day, essentially a 24-hour day, 
daylight, just one half of a day, or indefinite periods of time. And he states appropriately that this word yom occurs 2,291 times in the Old Testament, and it almost always means a literal day. When used in the plural form yomim, 845 times, it always refers to a literal day. When modified by numerical or an ordinal in historical narrative, 359 times in the Old Testament, of, uh, like Genesis 1, it always means a literal day. And each time it was modified. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And on the seventh day, God rested. When modified by evening and morning, 38 times outside of Genesis 1, it always means a literal day. So it certainly would mean the same in Genesis 1. It forms a basis for our work week of six literal days, Exodus chapter 20. Now, proper interpretation is a solar day, not in definite periods of time. On day number three of creation, God said, let the dry land appear, and the dry land appeared. That dry land involves the entire infrastructure, involves the core of the earth, involves the surface structure. The water was already there, and it involves particularly the granite. I spoke to you in session number one about the granite. According to the evolutionary model, this granite worldwide, which today averages between 8 and 16 miles in thickness, depending on whether it's been crumpled into mountain formations or is simply underlying the basic uh, strata of the earth, this granite, according to evolutionary hypothesis, took 300 million years to crystallize. But according to the biblical record on day number three, God said, let the dry land appear, and the dry land appeared. Is that plausible? Dr. Robert Gentry, to whom I referred in the first session, did some marvelous work in which he showed that the inclusions, the little pleochroic halos, the tiny little rings of energy circling the nucleus of a body, are circling the area where a body of radioactive material has transmuted to another element. Dr. Gentry found the rings left by polonium-218, polonium-210, and polonium-214. The half-life of polonium-210 is 22 days. Now, remember that after seven half-lives, all of that particular radioactive material is gone. So, the least the day, uh, or at the outside, the day would have to be just a few weeks, even if it were outside the literal day. But it cannot work outside a literal day. Not only did Dr. Gentry find the pleochroic halos of polonium-210, but he found the halos left by polonium-218. The half-life of polonium-218 is less than three minutes. In 20 minutes, all of the polonium-218 in a body of polonium-218 would be gone. So in a matter of minutes, that crust had to be formed. The granite had to be intact and functioning and recording. But it's better still. Dr. Gentry found that polonium-214, whose half-life is 0.000164 seconds, 164 milliseconds, after seven half-lives had elapsed, you certainly could not have even snapped your finger faster than we can snap a finger, all of the polonium-214 would be gone. That means that it had to be crystallized, functional, and recording in a very brief period of time. That has to be a literal day. Now, not only is the surface structure a design, but the internal structure was designed with moderating elements that are radioactive. Uh, remember that water is heated up by radioactivity. Remember that 40 feet of water will stop even uh, very powerful radiation in the gamma range level. The structure is that inside the earth there are moderating elements that give off a gentle heat. Watch this closely. 
The purpose of radioactive materials is to generate heat. I live a few miles from the Comanche Peak nuclear reactor. The purpose of that reactor is to simply, with the right amount of fusionable, uh, fissionable material, with the right amount of that fissionable material, to uh, put it close enough together so that it'll heat up the water to generate steam, to drive the turbines, to generate electricity. Very simple and forthright. Radioactive material is designed to give off heat. Watch closely. Before the flood of Noah's day, this firmamental canopy was in place from day two all the way to the first day of the flood. It filtered out shortwave radiation. It filtered out some of the infrared radiation, which means that we would only have a gentle temperature buildup during the light of day. Now, plants, botanists tell us, do so much better if you generate pink light for them. We have scientific data showing that. Remember that the color of that was a gentle pink, magenta. That triggers the growth and reproductive cells of plants. In addition to that, plants do better if the roots are heated two or three degrees above the ambient temperature. Everything is designed for the optimal genetic function of all living systems, the earth and the entire universe. So we have a structure built inside the earth which will gently radiate nuclear reaction, which will gently heat up the waters, which will gently warm the roots of the plants. How large did those plants get? Well, I'll have to give you an illustration. Let me build the context. Here we have an envelope in place, keeping the atmospheric pressure in place. Later, I'll refer to stats showing that Neil Teague, one of our very fine consultants, given the indication that geophysicists know the Earth has expanded, has refined the diameter of the Earth. It was approximately 10% less. It has expanded at the time of Noah's flood and Peleg, which we will study later in these sessions. Don't miss a single session. Given a 90% diameter of the Earth before the flood, given the additional gravitational attraction, given the compression of this bubble of water with very thin metallic hydrogen suspended inside this crystalline structure, altogether that would compress the atmosphere to 28 pounds per square inch. Our refined consideration is today 14.7 pounds per square inch at sea level, but we added essentially another atmosphere pressure due to the conditions I've just described, which means we had hyperbaric atmospheric pressure twice our current atmospheric pressure. Also, geologists have found in the structure of the limestones a greater amount of carbon dioxide, essentially eight times our current amount. We currently have 0.026% carbon dioxide. We, at that time, would have had just about 0. 25% carbon dioxide. Greater atmospheric pressure, filtration of the ultraviolet, uh, generation of pink light, and gentle heating of the plant. What will this do? In the fossil record, everything is bigger. Everything is larger. We're talking about day number three. We first had the structure of the earth, and then we had the plants created on day number three. Now, these plants were created completely functional. Remember on day number one, this sphere of water was com completely created functional as a sphere of water. On day number two, the crystalline firmament was functional. On day number three, the infrastructure of the earth, internal and surface, were totally functional. Remember, it was functional faster than we can snap our fingers. Also, the plant life created on day number three was totally functional with immediate youth but functional maturity. Class, remember that expression. Immediate youth and functional maturity. Let me prove it to you that the biblical record, which is the manual of scientific creation, uh, the biblical record shows clearly that this was the case. The creator on day number three created the plants or the vines the fruit was on the vine, and the seed 
was in the fruit. That meant that the moment they were created, they were functionally mature, yet young, healthful, ready to be devoured, or ready to be harvested. Ready to reproduce, or ready to be harvested. How big do those plants get? Today we have a plant called the Lycopsid club moss. The tallest we can grow it is about 16, maybe 18 inches. But in the fossil record, that very same plant got up to 120 feet tall. How do we explain that? The evolutionary scenario does not even attempt to explain it, but the creation model, particularly this creation model, creation and symphony, can explain it. Not long ago, an outstanding scientist at Keio University, Tokyo, Japan, Dr. Ki Mori, planted a single tomato plant. Now, he planted this tomato plant in his basement of all places. He had his office in the basement, and the Japanese are very fond of having all the physical world expressed in miniature. He planted a nice little cherry tomato plant. You're aware of the fact that the cherry tomato plant gets bush high. Uh, the mature tomato is the size of a cherry, maybe the size of a quarter. And he planted his um, tomato plant in his basement. It was growing fairly well, but he needed more light. He didn't want to bring in more electricity, so he had a brilliant idea. Out at the university, he had some fiber optic cable. He brought it home, ran it out the roof of his house, through his attic, the rafters, down the walls to his basement, and directed it toward his plant. Now, it worked beautifully. It picked up the rays of the sun, transferred them down, shown them directly on his plant. And what Dr. Mori forgot was fiber optic cable filters out ultraviolet radiation like water filters out ultraviolet radiation and like that firmament above the earth would have filtered out ultraviolet radiation as long as it was in place until the time of Noah's flood. So the light he was getting on his tomato plant was essentially like the light we had before Noah's flood. Let's see what happened to his tomato plant. It started to grow extremely well. He knew he had something. In fact, it grew so well he had to take it out of his basement. He took it over to his lab, built a special platform, built a canopy filtering out ultraviolet radiation. But he knew the plant wanted more carbon dioxide and nutrients than it could get normally. So, brilliant scholar. He used a pliable gasket at the top of the stalk, one at the bottom, designed a cylinder, added atmospheric pressure to get the stalk to accept more carbon dioxide and more nutrients. Wonderful. It would have been better had the entire plant been encapsulated in greater atmospheric pressure, but that's very expensive to do. So, essentially, he was simulating the creation model to a great degree. Before the flood, we had the greater atmospheric pressure, the greater concentration of carbon dioxide, filtration of ultraviolet, etc. Now, his plant grew wild. Let's see what happened to it. Here is a photo of his plant after two years. His tomato plant is a tree. 16 feet tall with 903 tomatoes on it. And those cherry tomatoes are not cherry tomato size. They are baseball size. But that's not the end of the story. That's after two years. His plant is now about 14 years old. It is still being maintained. He had to take it inside a huge hotel. It is now approximately 40 feet tall, has approximately 15,000 baseball-sized cherry tomatoes on it. What I'm trying to say is, if we simulate the conditions before Noah's flood, we get a wonderful result and we produce specimens that are approximately the size of specimens caught in the worldwide flood laid down in the fossil record. So the fossil record does not illustrate millions of years of evolutionary progression. The fossil record represents layer upon layer of sedimentary deposit, 
that occurred just a few hours apart in a global flood. The creation model works. I think we've seen that there's design in this entire area of creation. But let's just see how designed it is. I brought to studio a sketch. I've mentioned again and again in this series of lectures that all of the creation is infrastructured. The cell, every component of the cell is interdependent and codependent. We're now learning that the entire universe is orchestrated for the benefit of man. And if the proton, scholars have found that if the proton did not have its specific charge, then the hemoglobin with an iron atom with a number of other atoms surrounding it, the hemoglobin would not have the right charge to pick up the oxygen to transfer it to the body if the spin of the proton, the mass of the proton, and the behavior of the proton were not precise, you couldn't get blood to live. That means the universe has to be at a perfectly orchestrated balance. Wow, that's interrelationship. But now, upon Earth, there's an interrelationship. I've emphasized that the days of creation have to be solar days, have to be literal days, essentially 24 our days. Let me show you how this is verified in creation. On day number three, we had the plants created. One of those plants is a particular variety of fig. But that particular fig cannot be procreated without a fig wasp that is designed especially for its benefit. Now remember, we're just on day number three during this creation. It is not until days five and six that the insects are created. So if those days were long periods of time, this particular variety of fig would see its demise long before its procreating wasp arrived. Let me show you how infrastructure this really is. Inside the fig, there are closed flowers out of which a male wasp emerges. He was laid in there and hatched in there. Immediately, instantly, in the darkness, he is designed to do the following. He searches for the female wasps who have not yet emerged. He fertilizes them, then he does one other thing. He digs a hole, drills a hole, eats a hole from the inside of the fig to the surface shell of the fig, then he retreats and dies. His job's over. Hours later, the female wasp proceeds. She hatches, arrives. Now, she immediately goes through the hole dug by her brother, the male counterpart. She goes to another fig, just like it. She enters and starts searching for the flowers. Now, before she exits the first one, being feminine, she has to inspect the whole house. So this female wasp, just hatched, checks all the flowers. And as she checks them, the pollen gets all over her. Then she exits the hole, the channel, dug by or eaten by her brother. She then proceeds, goes inside the next fig, by a special channel that is one way only. She then inspects two kinds of flowers. One is the male that has antlers. She, of course, has pollen from the first pig. She, from that first fig, then pollinates the male flowers. Then she goes to the female flower, which does not have the antlers. She deposits eggs, and then she dies. The cycle is over. And the only way this fig can be pollinated is by that particular wasp. In other words, the creation of day number three could not have continued had these been long periods of time before that particular wasp was created. The evolutionists have a very difficult time explaining that principle. It's called a symbiotic relationship, one 
depends on the other. Each of these life forms depend on the other. So day number three of creation was orchestrated. That brings us to day number four. On day number four, the stellar heavens were created. Remember a principle that has been clearly rendered in this series. All of the creation was immediately young, no scars, no mutations, everything with optimal genetic expression, immediate youth, but functional maturity. On day number one of creation, we find the light expressed from the Creator Himself. That light flooded the entire universe. Now think about that for a moment. If light flooded the entire universe, leading evolutionary scholars have published that light did flood the entire universe. If a Big Bang occurred, it had to occur with the following statistics. In 10 to the minus 30th of a second, that small unit of light and energy had to expand 10 to the 50th power of dimensions. I asked one of NASA's very fine engineers to put that in his computer. He came back to me a few hours later and he said, now you want me to take a very small bit of energy, 10 to the minus 30th of a, uh, of a second expanding, and its dimension is infinite, the size of a pinhead, and in the time expressed of 10 to the minus 30th of a second, you want me to expand that 10 to the 50th dimensions. Correct. That's what the evolutionary astrophysicists have suggested would be plausible. He came back a few hours later and he said, that is infinite velocity that would flood the universe completely with light. Well, now we're not saying it began with that explosion. That is not our thesis at all. We're saying the Creator stated, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light that it was good, and that light flooded the entire universe. Physicists have admitted that in light is the necessary energy for the functioning and later transmutation of all the physical elements in the star bodies. So these two models parallel, it's just that the time is entirely different, and it is that, according to the evolutionary model, Time, chance, and natural circumstances become the hero of the plot, when in the creation model, it is a purposefully divined, orchestrated creation committed by an intelligent, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient creator, God. So, on day number one of creation, the universe was flooded with light. If in all the other areas of the creation, you have immediate youth and functional maturity, then it's certainly plausible that on day number four, when God coalesced the stellar bodies into place, the blazing suns and whirling galaxies, he did that with immediate youth and functional maturity. I've had individuals say, now wait a minute, how are you going to get the energy back to planet Earth? Watch closely. How big is the universe? I don't know. It's as big as the Creator wants it to be. There are a lot of postulates, but no one knows for sure except the Creator Himself. No matter how big it is, it's no problem in the creation model. You see, I type. I go dot, dot, dot. I push a carriage. It comes back. The typewriter carriage comes back. I go dot, 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 push a carriage. It comes back. Now we work with a computer. We work on a screen. We push a button. That computer printer goes zip, 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 zip. There are computer printers that can start from the bottom and print from the top simultaneously. I was lecturing on this in Oklahoma City. One of our consultants, Dr. Dale Peterson, came up and he said, you're right, but it's better than that. He said, I have a new computer. I type what I want. I can uh, schematically design a universe on the screen. I push the button and the printer goes splat and prints it all simultaneously. Now, don't you think God's a little smarter than we are? 
if we're at the point where in our universal expression we can instantly get all of the data aligned logically, systematically, intelligently, where it all benefits the design we're asking for. If we can do that with our creativity, it's simply a, a orders of magnitude for the creator who is in charge of all of it to do the very same thing. Stellar bodies are in place systematically. Let me give you some data that I think would be interesting. A number of scholars have wrestled with the problem. Do we have a geocentric universe or a heliocentric solar system? Well, let's see. Geocentric means that the sun would revolve around the earth and the stars would revolve around the earth. Heliocentric, of course, would mean that in the solar system, you have the Earth revolving around the Sun, and then the Sun going through his uh, circuits of the entire universe, which is true. Sir Frederick Hoyle, one of the world's leading academicians, has stated recently, geocentricity is the Copernician theory or the Ptolemaic theory correct? Copernician theory is heliocentricity. Ptolemaic theory is geocentricity, which is correct. Dr. Hoyle stated, and he is certainly not a creationist in our sense of the word, he began as an atheist and certainly as an evolutionist, but has found that the data does not support that position. Dr. Hoyle said the relation of the two pictures, geocentricity or heliocentricity, is reduced to a mere coordinate transformation. And it is the main tenet of the Einstein theory that any two ways of looking at the world which are related to each other by a coordinate, coordinate transformation are entirely equivalent from a physical point of view. So from a physical point of view, you can refer either way. So when the Bible refers to the sun rising and setting, not only is that an earth-centered concept, but that's an Einsteinian concept as well. Some vast bodies have been found out in the universe. Let's take a look at a very special display. I want to talk to you about some academic research before we look at this in some detail. Margaret Geller and John Hutcha of Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics found a great wall out in the universe. 500 million light years across, 300 million light years high, and 15 million light years thick. Johns Hopkins University, uh, in conjunction with the University of Illinois, found superclusters that I'll illustrate in just a moment, appearing at regular intervals 400 million light years apart. Seven separate clumps to the north and seven separate clumps of superclusters to the south in the galactic or in the universal sense. Now, did you get that? I've been illustrating the creation and symphony model. I've been trying to emphasize the fact that it's all designed. They're now in a major quandary, trying to understand how all of this could have been structured by evolutionary processes, when instead it appears to be structured independent of those processes and by a specific design. In the 1600s, a star in the constellation of Cygnus became bright. It's called P. Cygni. It was half again as bright in the 1700s as it is today. What this means is astrophysicists are finding that that star is aging too fast. And that means that its entire history can be calculated in hundreds of years, not in thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. There's an infrastructure that is very young. In trapezium in the Orion Nebula, four stars are moving apart from a common point at high speed. Out in the constellations, in one particular area in the Orion Nebula, that's part of the Milky Way galaxy that you'll see in a moment illustrated, four stars are moving apart from a common point at high speed. At that speed, that common point would have converged just 10 thousand years ago. I'm trying to say everything is orchestrated. A leading scholar recently published in Scientific American
Previously, it seemed scientifically unsound to have light created before the sun. The present scientific view does indeed assume the early universe to be filled with various kinds of radiation. He said that's consistent with a biblical statement, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, let's illustrate this particular chart. Our point is that not only is the creation orchestrated, designed, but it is orchestrated and designed by a creator. There's only one plausible creator whose work matches that of the rest of the data, and that is the creator of the Bible expressed in the person of Jesus Christ. Let's see if the constellatory bodies have anything to do with consistency with what he claimed to be. First of all, there's Polaris, the North Star. That's used for direction. The creator of the Bible, and the creator in this model, have an invitation for us to follow that creator in purposeful meaning to life. To show, the, to show and locate the North Star, we have a system called the Big Dipper. And one of the stars from the outer bowl points directly to the North Star. This is a cluster of seven stars, and a central star gives it its very meaning. It's called Mizar, and it has to do with the sheepfold. We call this Ursa Major. However, it actually is not a bear with a long tail. No one saw a bear with a long tail. The very meaning of the stars themselves in the composite indicates a sheepfold with special care by the shepherd. And then the handle points to Arcturus, which is a primary star in the constellation of Bootes, the shepherd. So we have a design indicated here. Leadership, guidance, a fold, and a shepherd to do the designing. That shepherd is not simply sufficient for our needs, but in the constellation of Leo, he is seen as the lion of the tribe of Judah, totally consistent with his own power to create the universe. He is also seen in Gemini as dual nature, the God-man, and he certainly manifests himself as the God-man. In this universe, he is also expressed in Virgo, holding the scepter, and here we've envisioned that creator with the scepter in his hands in his lap. We have had, already illustrated previously, the beautiful design of star clusters. We've abbreviated these into seven from the great wall in the center with four on each side, or three on each side, but there actually are seven to the north and seven to the south, spaced 400 million light years apart, design which evolutionary hypothesis cannot understand. Let's illustrate that again. Finally, a glorious array to this central display of the Creator's handiwork is further outlined of himself and finally the Milky Way as a tremendous canopy of joy, emphasis, and glory to the Creator himself. There is further design in this creation which will require additional information for us to present. Let me conclude this particular lecture by pointing to the solar system itself. The solar system is composed of, of course, the Sun, Mercury, Mars, Earth. We have the interior planets, the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Earth, and then with Mars as the starting point here, we have, of course, Jupiter, some asteroids, we have Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Kepler felt that the vibratory cycle in the elliptical union of these planets with the Sun would indeed give off a musical note. Not only are these spaced intricately for influences,
or biological influences, that is not to say that your life is determined by astrology. By no means we condemn that position. But the Bible clearly indicates that everything was orchestrated for the benefit of man. Kepler was right. It has recently been found that the idea of celestial notes has a valid basis since musical notes are always produced by repeated regular vibrations whether originating from vibrating strings, reeds, or drum membranes. As the planets circle the sun, the motion of each one is unique in its form in a slow, regular vibration. Don DeYoung, splendid researcher. And of course, all of the masses, charges, and other properties of the subatomic particles, according to Science Magazine, arise from vibrations at different frequencies, a uniform chorus of violins playing a symphony of different notes. Now, wait a moment. Science Magazine article recently admitted that the entire universe is producing a symphony. Kepler did excellent work to show that particular notes from B and G and C sharp and E flat and F and E flat and additionally C, G, E, F sharp, etc. all were inherently involved in the constellary or orbital operation of the planets. Now we find the universe bringing symphony to us. Sky and Telescope magazine stated, as if by a chain, our planet's surface is connected intimately with the space environment. And then Uranus and Neptune, according to a special publication in a secular journal, have great pressures of extreme heat so that all the carbon atoms have been compressed into diamonds. Let's take this a little further. With these very large planets having a diamond infrastructure, with a vibratory cycle, it has been found in some of NASA's research that there are literal tones emanating from some of these planets that they've been able to analyze. Robert Whitelow wrote of Harmony in the Heavens. He's a very fine scholar at Virginia Polytechnic. Robert Whitelow indicated that these planetary alignments and their masses and this, the area they sweep out not only sweep the very same amount of space in proportion to their velocity, but they're all related to various instruments, at least mathematically. It is stated that Pythagoras had reported that he could hear the celestial sounds. None of his disciples could, however. Now, the notes played, current, secular, astrophysicists admit that because of the vibratory cycle and because of the spherical alignment around the sun in the rotations, these particular notes would be played and some of them indicate actual melody. Shakespeare wrote, look now in Merchant of Venice, how the floor of heaven is thick inlaid with patines of bright gold. There's not the smallest orb which thou beholdest, but in his motion like an angel sings. Such harmony is in immortal souls, but whilst this muddy vesture of clay does grossly close it in, we cannot hear it, or can we? Work has been done to show in 21st century science and technology that there is a relationship, a conical relationship, with this musical scale in orbits of the planets and the biological systems they have published data to show that the antenna of the DNA actually picks up vibratory cycles. They've illustrated this as the DNA is tuned or energized by these vibratory cycles. Let's take it one step further. In the book of Job, chapter 38, verse 7, the Creator said to the patriarch Job, Were you there? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Some of our researchers have found cause to believe that the firmament 
in its crystalline capacity. Matched precisely the ingredients of a crystal radio receiver with a crystal, an antenna, water makes a very good antenna, and you will find the crystalline metallic hydrogen intercomposition to complement that, a crystal, an antenna, an energy field, and the Bible does specifically state that it's the morning stars that sang. What we're finding is all of the stars sing to us. All of the planets sing to us. All of the energy of radiation in its vibratory cycle sings to us. But we're learning that if it's the morning stars singing, there is a real plausibility factor indicating that that canopy could actually pick up and audibilize that music so that individuals could hear it. In fact, a physicist whose name is Torelli, a lady, recently received her PhD doing research on the radio signals coming from pulsars. And she stated in a science journal recently that we actually are being hugged by this cosmic radio energy. And she actually took the digitalized information that's there, transferred it, and produced a tape, audibleized it. And it actually is a soothing, healthful hugging of cosmic radiation. One missionary from Alaska wrote that within the last few years, Near the top of the globe, near the area where the concentrated lines of energy are stronger in moment and energy, that you, some of the missionaries and Eskimos actually report notes, audible notes, being heard because of the ice crystals and the charged lines of energy. I highly suspect that before the flood, each morning, when the rays of energy were just right, when the energy level was appropriate, we could pick up some of the soothing background music that the stars, particularly the pulsars, are giving off with a background harmonious solar system actually blending in so that we could feel and sometime hear the music of the spheres. There's much more to come. Don't miss the next section. The God of creation has a specific identity. There is no mistaking his existence or his handiwork. Follow in his footsteps and appreciate his handiwork as our speaker lights the way. Welcome to the fourth session of Creation in Symphony. In the last session, we considered day number four of creation, the stellar heavens. And I think it would be appropriate that we tie that with day number five. The point of creation and symphony as a model is that the entire creation is interrelated and interdependent upon the creator himself. Is the universe a young universe? We have various suggestions that the redshift indicates that the universe is old. The redshift indication is a calculation whereby galaxies or stars receding uh, at a, a very fast rate deep in space would give off colors that would tend toward the red. However, Dr. Arp has published an entire book. He's a world-class astronomer, and he has published data showing that the redshift has nothing to do with velocities and distance. It has to do with the nature of life, a light, and can have to do with the intergalactic uh, particles themselves. Dr. Wolf has found that optically, these data show that light itself has the characteristics of tending toward the red, has nothing to do with velocity. Therefore, the handle on 
how old the universe is, is very shaky. In our opinion, the universe is a part of the original design just a few thousands of years ago. Let me give a bit of substantiating information to indicate that the universe is not nearly as old as it had been previously calculated to be. Dr. Hadley Wood, in unveiling the universe, a secular publication, stated, we know of no process that can maintain a spiral arm for more than two galactic revolutions. You know, of course, there are beautiful and gorgeous deep space galaxies that have spiral arms. And he said, we know of no process that can maintain a spiral arm for more than two galactic revolutions. Dr. C.B. Clausen, in Exploring the Distant Stars, again a secular publication, wrote, if this theory is true, the universe is young since it has so many rapidly revolving spirals. Indications and data are mounting that the universe is not nearly as old as we had postulated that it would be. An evolutionist and an astronomer, Jeffrey Burbridge, former director of Kitt Peak National Observatory, relating to the information I just gave to you, stated that evidence of this kind exists if it is accepted, it means three things. Number one, that at least some quasars do not lie at so-called cosmological distances. Very interesting. Number two, that at least some parts of the redshift of quasars are due to some effect other than the expansion of the universe. Very interesting. Number three, that quasars are physically related to bright, comparatively nearby galaxies. And of course, the creator could have extended the galaxies as far as he wanted, and he created those in uh, cluster bands systematically orchestrated throughout the universe. In so doing, he had a design and a purpose. Frank Wilson, a secular writer, stated, comparing all of this universe with its fine-tuned increments to 10th to the 55th power of tuning and refinement, very convenient. Frank Wilson wrote that the mind of man can influence the material world at the basic level of quarks and electrons. Now we get into a subject which shows that we as individuals watching this videotape at the moment, communicating, conversing with each other, have thought processes that actually have to do with the symmetry or the chaos, cooperation or chaos in the universe. We have been designed in the image of the Creator Himself. We've been given a free will to operate. And it appears that we will be held accountable for our influence far beyond that of the immediate relationships that we have. So Frank Wilson wrote, the mind of man can influence the material world at its basic level of quarks and electrons. Dr. Kevin McLeod, a creation researcher, reported that French physicist stated that school children, after their experiments had been done, they published that school children, by thought alone, can alter the decay rate of radioactive emission. That is absolutely amazing. It appears that we too are a part of the entire universe at the basic level, and all of this has to be by design. Paul Davies, in Cosmic Blueprint, a secular evolutionary astrophysicist and physicist, wrote, the impression of design is overwhelming. The universal impression of design is overwhelming. Astronomer George Greenstein wrote, as we survey all the evidence, the thought insistently arises that some supernatural agency or capital A in the agency must be involved in the capitalization of choice. Is it possible that suddenly, without intending to, we have stumbled upon scientific proof of the existence of a supreme being? Was it God who stepped in and so providentially crafted the cosmos for our benefit? I suggest that it certainly was. Evolutionist William Stansfield, Ph.D., California Polytechnic Institute, or State University, stated, It is obvious that radiometric techniques may not be the absolute dating methods that they are claimed to be. 
I'm sure everyone in this audience, whether it be children in school, professors who chair departments, have relied very heavily on radiometric dating to show that the Earth is old. We've been talking about cosmological distances and factors which indicate that the universe may not be nearly as old as we had postulated, and the fact that there is design in the universe throughout all the universe, and the fact that our minds actually bear a responsibility for some of the basic functioning of that universe at the energy level. That being the case, let's examine some of the internal structure, radioactive materials. This model solves a major problem. We have in the sedimentary deposits of the Earth worldwide radioactive materials. We have been able to calculate the rate at which they decay and have been able to calculate by some uh, forensic analysis that uh, various individuals were there, that they've been caught as fossils. Uh, forensic analysis can actually uh, assign an age, a recent age, to certain activities. And then uh, geological activities and paleontological activities can assign long ages, but often based on radiometric dating, carbon-14, etc. In the creation and symphony model, it solves the whole thing because the internal structure of the Earth before the cataclysm of the flood held these radioactive elements in perfect balance, a controlled nuclear reactor. At the time of the flood, these were expunged and they essentially have nothing to do with the age of the Earth. They have to do with the design of the Earth instead. So evolutionist William Stansfield wrote regarding radiometric techniques that it is obvious now that radiometric techniques may not be the absolute dating methods they're claimed to be. Age estimates on a given geological stratum by different radiometric methods are often quite different sometime by hundreds of millions of years. Did you get that? We think we have a handle, or that scholars have a handle, and you read in the newspaper that a uh, certain stratum was assigned a particular age, or a fossil, or a bone, or a skeleton assigned a particular age. Well, let's see if it really is that scientific. He stated that different methods often yield different ages, sometime by hundreds of millions of years. There is no absolutely reliable long-term radiological clock. That's a statement by a, a leader in the field of specialty. Evolutionist Frederick B. Juniman wrote, and I like this quote, there's been in recent years the horrible realization that radio decay rates are not as constant as previously thought, nor are they immune to environmental influences. And this could mean that the atomic clocks are reset during some global disaster and events which brought the Mesozoic, age of the dinosaurs, to a close may not be 65 million years old, but rather within the age and memory of man. Class, did you get that statement? A leading evolutionary scholar admits that when you put it all together, it's possible, since various factors reset the clocks, it's possible that the Mesozoic era, which is the era of the dinosaurs, you scholars will recognize it's Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous in period. It closed, according to evolutionary theory, 65 million years ago. But now there is the admission that actually it could have closed within the memory of man. And that is exactly what we are suggesting and stating. All the creation is recent. In the last session, we talked about the plants. Let me tie that in with this session because everything is interrelated. Today we're going to get to the fish and the fowl and hopefully we'll get further into the series. There is a plant called a voodoo lily. This lily relies on a beetle exclusively for its pollination. You see, all of these days have to be solar days. They have to be recent. The entire creation is systematically orchestrated to function as a single unit. The voodoo lily is pollinated exclusively by a beetle. 
A beetle that responds to a particular odor. This plant, when it is ready to pollinate, actually raises its temperature by design as many as 35 degrees Fahrenheit. And in raising its temperature, it releases enzymes with the odor that attract the beetle. He proceeds within the lily, finds himself covered with pollen, proceeds to the next lily, and then the process closes. This means there was orchestrated design in the entire mechanism of interchange of information. Well, what God did on day number one, two, three, and four was preparation for day number five. On day number five, God created the fish and the fowl. How large were the fish or fishes? I hold the tooth of a shark. This shark was actually almost 100 feet long. There is no way in today's ecology and ecosphere we could grow a shark that large. There are reasons for that. In the pre-flood environment, the fish could get a lot larger. The entire biota was a lot larger. And that shark's tooth illustrates the fact that it was a lot larger. I'd like to emphasize that the fishes are very complicated creatures. Sharks are able to maintain an identification with their entire environment. They're able to pick up electric signals of anything alive or pulsating. They're able to function as responding to a universe of waters. Other fishes have amazing abilities. For instance, the dolphin is able to send out sonar. And he does it by using nasal sacs and the melon. He sends out impulses. They actually reverberate uh, in a cavity of his skull. They're sent forth and then they're picked up in a small bladder area and through a series of bones that then delicately connect with the middle ear. Very sophisticated sonar so that he knows exactly where he is at all times. Along with a regular fish there would of course be snails and other creatures and here's a little snail that actually has darts. He actually produces a very delta streamlined dart that in today's ecology is toxic. But in the pre-flood world, we highly suspect that it would not be toxic at all, but would be beneficial instead. He actually is able to shoot this out uh, a proboscis and you'll see in the close-up there are additional darts that are generated. They are loaded. This is a designed structure. There is no way that evolution could produce anything comparable to this. One of my favorite fishes is the Rossi. The Rossi is an amazing creature. He's a small fish, very colorful. He's a cleaner fish. He's illustrated here in this book from Institute for Creation Research. The Rossi's a little cleaner fish. Larger fish have gotten their teeth and jaws dirty by eating other fish as carnivores and by eating plants. So there's a system whereby you have a colony of little Rossi. These fish are very colorful and very animated and they stay in a primary area. Predator fish actually line up. Line up waiting their turn to have their teeth cleaned. A dental assistant. The last predator fish goes right on by. The new predator fish swims in and waits. These little Rossi fish go in, clean his mouth, back off, and you'd think, well, the fish would say, I have uh, the predator fish would say, I now have my teeth clean. I'm ready to start eating again. But he doesn't bother the benefactor fish at all. He goes off to another school of fish. And the next predator fish comes in line. 
Recognizing the necessity for these worldwide, the Creator designed a very novel way for procreation. The Rossi fish have in each little colony the domination of a male. The male fish is very colorful and uh, the females wait in line in the spawning process for the eggs to be germinated, fertilized rather, by the fish. And one male dominates that colony. So other males who are less dominant have to go on and seek for their own colony, but the Creator designed a special ability. They can go to search for their colony or they can change sexes. In a matter of minutes, these less dominant Rossi fish that have wandered up, see they're not going to be able to control the colony, so they get in line with the females and in a matter of minutes they can transfer with the ability to have eggs actually fertilized. But now in that transfer process they get near another female and they start using antics. They start going into gyrations and if they attract the attention of the female next to them they just go on and start their own colony and they stop the process of becoming a female. That way we have colonies dispersed throughout the aqueous nature throughout the water system with these little Rossies in their parts of the world doing a wonderful job. Creation is a far better explanation for that. I have no idea how an evolutionist would explain all of that fortuitous combination of circumstances and innate characteristics coming about by uh, natural selection, mutational variation, or any system. So, only God can do that. Thus, we have on day number five, the creation of the fishes. I've just touched uh, a bare introduction to the marvel within the marine life. Now let's go to the birds. I love the birds. The marvel of the birds is absolutely astounding. Actually, we call it the miracle of the birds. Everyone loves a hummingbird. They are designed with beautific colors, designed with a beak that's able to probe uh, into the inner parts of various flowers, and thus they cross-pollinate. Everyone loves, of course, the peacock and the bird of paradise. Birds have a miracle in design. Since they were designed to be avian, they have a very solid skull, but it's honeycombed so it will not be overweighted. And then the wing structure is not only honeycombed, it has struts in the design. It looks like an engineer designed those like you would design the wings of an airplane. Thus, the birds are very light and they're able to function in the atmosphere itself. These little hummingbirds actually use a figure eight configuration in the flapping of their wings. Therefore, they're able to stabilize themselves, able to back up, go forward, up, down, sideways, in any direction. They are a marvel of design. But let's take that marvel of design a little further. The woodpecker is absolutely amazing. He's an endangered species in many parts of the world. The woodpecker is able to keep borings clean within trees. And uh, we think that characteristic is uh, a recessive genetic characteristic. But his design is absolutely amazing. His tongue is able to extend from three to five times its normal length. Because his tongue splits, wraps around his throat, and then wraps around his skull. It comes out his right nostril, again feathers together, unites, and extends for the purpose and design for which he was created. There is no way that design could be explained by, again, mutational variation for two to his combination of circumstances. Then the penguin. The penguin looks really awesome in awkwardness on land. But the moment he's in the water, 
He is able to do spirals and figure eights and octagonal designs with a grace unmatched by anything else in all of creation. He's designed on day number five to enjoy the water and, of course, the atmosphere as well. The penguin, again, is a marvel of creation. We have for generations admired the ability of birds to migrate. Now, here we have the black pole warbler. And this little creature flies nonstop from New England to South America. And that's the metabolic equivalent of a human sprinting a four-minute mile for 80 hours without stopping. Did you get that, class? That's the equivalent of a human being in his metabolic rate, a human being sprinting a four-minute mile without stopping for 80 hours. That is absolutely amazing. The design of these creatures has to be very profound. And how do they navigate? They navigate by using the stars, by the sun, polarized light, the magnetic field, olfactory design like uh, pine forest that would give a memory to them. They're able to hear and pick up low frequency sonic vibrations caused by the wind that you and I couldn't hear at all. Again, this is a part of the design. I think one of my very favorite areas is the bee. The bee has the ama amazing ability to air condition his home. We're assuming that the flying insects were created on day number five and the rest of the insects on day number six. He's able to keep his home at a 95 degree temperature. Some of the worker bees will actually transport water from the outside, splash it on the sides of the hive in order to have it evaporate and cool the hive. Others are able to increase their metabolic rate and cluster in cold times to actually keep the temperature again inside the hive at 95 degrees. They use beeswax with absolute economy. They have a dance, and this dance is amazing. They use a configuration whereby they give the direction, they give the amount, they give the olfactory response and the satisfaction of the nectar or source. They give the distance so that any of the other bees can immediately go to the source of food. That communication has to be designed. But let me show you how they're also designed again with the rest of creation. On day number three, we had the plants created. On day number four, the stellar heavens. On day number five, the fish and the fowl and the winged insects as well. All of it is interrelated. There is a lily that is pollinated in a very special way. The lily has a platform that looks identical to a female bumblebee. Now, the male bumblebee hatches before the female. He proceeds, and at exactly the same time of season, it's the pollination time for this bee lily. And the pollen are ready. The platform is ready. The platform in color, texture, and scent is identical to a female bumblebee. So the male bumblebee proceeds to mate, but he doesn't have any luck. In the meantime, he rubs pollen all over his face and proceeds for the next two or three hours to other bee orchids. In turn, cross-pollinating them. Within a few hours, the female bumblebee has uh, been hatched and he sees he made a mistake and he proceeds to be with her instead of with the orchid. In the meantime, the orchid has been pollinated. A miracle of God's special design. But I think my favorite of all is the songbird. 
The songbird produces his song not to attract a mate. A chirp will suffice for that. Not to identify himself with his species in variety. Other signals can do that. Birds have very sophisticated communication. But he produces the song just for the benefit of man. It takes a very complicated process. For instance, he has a relatively small set of lungs, but attached to those lungs, he has large air sacs, and he has bronchial tubes, and these bronchi have valves. Here we have the lungs, the air sacs, the valve in the bronchi. Here we have the clavicular sac, which actually compresses around the membranes in the voice box. So as he compresses around the membranes in the voice box, as he inhales the air sufficient, he closes a valve in one of the bronchi tubes. He tenses the membrane, all of this simultaneously, and utters a note. Some birds, like the thrushes, can actually utter simultaneous notes that harmonize with each other. In addition to that, a songbird like the mockingbird is able to mimic sounds that he has just heard or sounds from other birds in their song. It's an amazingly delightful experience to hear the song and then to realize what's going on inside his designed body. There's a bird in Australia that's able to imitate any conceivable sound. He can imitate to some degree a human voice, the horn of a car, the whistle of a train, and any other bird in the forest. The melody by design of the songbird is a marvel of creation. So we have covered in this session the fish and the fowl of day number five. Now let's proceed to day number six. On day number six, we have the creation of the dinosaurs, the land reptiles, the marine reptiles had been created on day number five. Then we have the creation of the mammals, the rest of the insects, and finally, man. How large were those mammals? Throughout this series of lectures, I've been parading by this replica. This is a certified replica. The original is on display at West Texas State University in Canyon, Texas, excavated near Amarillo, Texas. This is an amazing specimen. What I'm holding is the fossil horns and skull of a bison, a buffalo, Bisoni latifrons. This bison whose today's counterpart stands about five feet in stature. This bison, however, stood 10 feet at the shoulders. In addition to that, the horns extended on out beyond the slight area that's missing, covered a full eight foot arc. This is the largest buffalo or bison ever found in all history, found in the sedimentary deposits. What this indicates is, in the past, mammals were larger. Camel remains have been found 19 feet tall. Beaver remains have been found 12 feet tall. It's absolutely astounding to realize that everything was larger in the past. Dragonflies that today have something like a four-inch wingspan. In the fossil record, had a 30 to 40 inch wingspan. Here is a 36 inch wingspan on a fossilized dragonfly. Actually, one was found in Italy with a 60 inch wingspan, a five foot wingspan to a dragonfly. Now, the evolutionary model has difficulty in explaining the existence of those creatures in such large forms. If we're supposed to be getting better, more viable, how is it that in the past things were larger than they are today? The evolutionary model has difficulty explaining that. However, the creation model has no difficulty at all. 
In the creation model, remember, we have the firmamental canopy above the earth filtering out the ultraviolet radiation. That ultraviolet radiation often diminishes the size of the embryo of mice in laboratory experiments. That would indicate that this influx of ultraviolet radiation is damaging us in so many areas. So when we did not have it, when the firmamental canopy filtered that out, then we certainly had the full embryological and genetic expression in its optimal form. Then when we add the atmospheric pressure, we solve a great problem. You see, I dig dinosaurs. I mean, literally dig dinosaurs. I have the privilege of being the discoverer and the director of the excavation of the largest and most complete Acrocanthosaurus ever found. Acrocanthosaurus looked a lot like Tyrannosaurus rex, except that he had spikes on the back of his neck and down through his shoulders and hip and all the way to near the bottom of his tail. The one that uh, we found and excavated at Glenrose stood approximately 20 feet tall and 40 feet long. Dinosaurs are very intriguing creatures. They were created on day number six of the creation. I have with me a very special fossil egg. The inset at the bottom of the screen will show details. A major hospital facility recently CAT scanned and x-rayed this egg for us. And it was so astounding that it's not even called an egg, now it's called a hatchling. And you will see some of that x-ray at the inset at the bottom of your screen. I want you to notice First, the egg portions of the shell still intact. But notice under the cracked shell are body formations. Notice the skull, and that will show in the x-rays as well at the bottom of the screen. Notice the eye sockets and the little snout. If you can pull the camera in very closely, you'll see a nice little mouth registered. And then notice the neck, the shoulders, the hip structure. Now remember this is an egg that's hatching. It's not an embryo. This is a little dinosaur coming out of an egg, so he's fully developed. The beautiful symmetrical hip structure, the area where the tail is formed and tucks, and then the tail is completely formed, and you'll see him wiggling that tail, working that tail out when he got caught in a tremendous catastrophe. Portions of the egg are still stuck to his tail. The tail fully developed, forms around, and tucks gently under his neck. This is most unusual. What they found as they x-rayed and CAT scanned this very unique and valuable specimen of a dinosaur egg or hatchling what they found were various cavities. He was already breathing. The fluid had been expelled, and he was now breathing air and filling his lungs. This is rare indeed. Dinosaurs are an amazing part of the creation. But the evolutionary model has a problem relating to the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs have been used in the evolutionary model for decades to illustrate brute, distant, evolving life forms. They've illustrated the theory of evolution. We have one of my favorites illustrated here, and that's Pachycephalosaurus. Pachycephalosaurus means bone-headed lizard. But Buddy Davis, one of our consultants, who does work comparable to the Smithsonian, uh, showed him in a profile that was delightful rather than brutish. But the dinosaurs had a problem in the evolutionary model. Let's see if I can clarify the problem and then address it and give an answer. Paleontologists were very hesitant to admit that the dinosaurs they excavated had very small rib cages indicating small lungs. When we were excavating the Acrocanthosaurus near Glenrose, when I got into the rib cage, I was astounded. 
the ribs were only about 22 inches long, very short, complete but very short, indicating a small lung capacity. How is it that a creature 20 feet tall, 40 feet long, supposedly a carnivore, could get enough oxygen to breathe in our atmosphere today? Well, the academic community of evolutionists finally said we've solved the problem. Dr. Landis, U.S. Geological Survey and of found air bubbles trapped in amber in the Cretaceous layering. Cretaceous, of course, means dinosaur remains uh, are there. Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, all of the Mesozoic era indicate that dinosaur remains are there. We do not agree with the time scale of the evolutionary hypothesis, but we do agree that dinosaurs were there. Our position is they were created at the same time man was created. In fact, in the book of Job, chapter 40, verses 15 through 24, the biblical record states, Behold now, behemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. The Creator goes on to describe behemoth as having a tail like an entire cedar tree, and as being the chief of the ways of God. What creature is the chief of the ways of God? I would suggest that it's the dinosaur. Seismosaurus is the largest dinosaur found to date, and he could raise his head 70 feet in the air, from snout to tail was 140 feet long and weighed almost 200,000 pounds. Now, the evolutionary model has a difficulty. You see, by standard evolutionary geophysics, it is postulated that the Earth expanded from 60% of its current diameter to 100% of its current diameter. And during the Jurassic, just before the Cretaceous, was, according to evolutionary theory, 60% of its current diameter. But what they have not calculated is that if you maintain the same mass and shrink the volume, you invoke the universal law of gravitation, which means that Seismosaurus, that supposedly was a Jurassic dinosaur, Seismosaurus, who weighed almost 200,000 pounds, if living on a 60% diameter Earth, would weigh over half a million pounds. That's absolutely impossible. Now, let's get to the other area that's problematic for the evolutionist. How can these big dinosaurs with a bulk weight to oxygenate, that's almost 200,000 pounds, get enough oxygen to feed the deep cell tissue of their bodies when their lungs are rather small? Well, Dr. Landis and others suggested they found the answer in a number of newspapers and a number of secular scientific journals paraded the information saying that as they crushed these air bubbles of amber, they found 30 to 35 percent oxygen ratio compared to today's 20 or 21 percent. But they admitted that the pressure inside those bubbles was eight to nine times our current atmospheric pressure. Pressures like that can actually tend to bleed nitrogen ratio and thus conserve oxygen ratio. That being the case, their figures are highly suspect. But let's take it a step further. In our model, we have twice the atmospheric pressure, domination of magenta light, filtration of ultraviolet, eight times the current carbon dioxide rate, bringing it from 0 0.026 to approximately 0.25 percent. But in recent weeks, we've also refined the model with very specific boundaries. It's been found that if you double the atmospheric pressure, you do something special. You're able to oxygenate the whole blood plasma. Back to the dinosaur problem. Secular researchers thought they had solved the problem by giving 30% to 35% oxygen ratio to the dinosaurs. But you have two problems there. That only saturates the hemoglobin with oxygen. It takes additional atmospheric pressure to saturate the blood plasma. The creation model 
with two atmospheres of pressure, one above our current ambient atmosphere of pressure, actually solve the problem. But the ratio of oxygen has to remain low, down around 23 to 25 percent. Otherwise, you introduce volatility to the atmosphere. So the creation model solves the problem from every direction. Dinosaurs were a vital part of the creation. Now we come to a special area of consideration. Man. Man is very unique. In the next lecture, we will study just how unique man really is. But in the closing moments of this lecture, let's, let's talk about fossil men, just for a brief period of time. I have the privilege of having excavated some very fine fossils. For instance, an Indian called Princess Petit, who is at the University of Texas in the Balcones Laboratory. And I have had the privilege of examining various artifacts at various parts of the world, having been in approximately 20 different countries. It is currently stated that the Australopithecines led finally to Cro-Magnon uh, through Homo habilis, Homo erectus to Cro-Magnon, and of course to Neanderthal man. But in this ascent of man, there are various areas that have not been covered with academic research. Sir Solly Zuckerman, one of the world's leading physical anatomists, has examined the remains at Old Olduvai and also other remains of supposed early hominids. And he has stated unequivocally in scientific journals that if man evolved from ape, he didn't leave a single trace of his ascent from ape to man. He has stated that these remains of Homo habilis are actually the remains of an Australopithecine ape. Even Homo erectus could not actually walk erect. Recent studies have indicated and scientific journals have published the fact that the inner ear balance was insufficient for him to have walked erect. Man has always been man, has always been man. Mary Leakey published the famous Letoli tracks that are certainly humanoid and I believe fully human. In fact, they have the great toe, the phalanges trench. They have, as I will point out in our verdict footprint, the great toe, the phalanges trench, even though the four toes are not distinctive. They have the ball, metatarsal base, the interior longitudinal arch, the heel, the exterior longitudinal arch, and a slight bulge in the exterior longitudinal arch. All of these are unique to Homo sapien, to mankind. Now, mankind is also the only individual who is able, by design, to imprint. By imprint, we mean step deliberately within someone else's footprints. At Le Toli, you have three sets of prints, one stepping in another and another and another. Thus, you actually have Homo sapien. You have man. You do not have an early form of Homo. In our research at Glen Rose, our excavations have proceeded to the point where we have excavated a major dinosaur, 208 dinosaur footprints, and 57 human footprints within those dinosaur footprints. A number of those footprints have the great toe, the four other toes, or at least the phalanges trench, the ball, metatarsal arch, medial and longitudinal arches, and the bulge in the lateral arch, the longitudinal arch. There's no question that we have evidence that man and dinosaur lived contemporaneously. Leading evolutionary scholars Mildy and Schaefersman admitted that if man and dinosaur lived contemporaneously, that totally destroys the concept of evolution. And I certainly agree with that part of their postulate. So we've come to the conclusion of this discussion, introducing man. It is not the purpose of this series of lectures to go at length into the hominids and the supposed fossils, but 
Evidence currently indicates that man and dinos man, dinosaur, and all of man's supposed predecessors lived parallel, lived simultaneously. Therefore, there is no precursor leading one vector to another, as Stephen Jay Gould indicated. It looks like creation matches all of the criteria, not only as a bona fide scientific explanation for life origins, but as a superior, the superior explanation for life origins. In our next session, don't miss our consideration of the uniqueness of man. Our next exciting venture leads us into the wonders of the creation. Around us resides the beauty of God's handiwork. Have you ever wondered how a bird could produce such melody and song? Have you marveled at the interrelationships in all living systems? Our next lecture will fascinate you and inspire appreciation for the Creator. Welcome to session number five of Creation in Symphony. We've talked about the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth days of creation, about the early part of the sixth day of creation, and we're going to major on the unique and ultimate design in the creation man. I'd like to emphasize that the infrastructure and interrelation and codependency of the entire creation are foundations for God to then create man in his own image. We have a wonderful, high, lofty, and noble position to fulfill. The background is that everything is interrelated. None of this creation is dependent on man for its existence. But man is dependent on the entire creation for his existence. There is a book I'd like to recommend to you from which we got a number of ideas and confirmation in uh, scholastic background showing the interrelationship of various life forms from moles to insects to fungi to bacteria. And in other publications, the interrelationship in the marine ventures uh, the cleansing effect of clams, sewage disposal units in the hard shells or shelled fish. All of this is a part of the interrelated infrastructure of planet Earth to make it a habitable place to live. The book I want to recommend to you is a book published from the evolutionary standpoint. Now that's rare for me to say. I rarely recommend text with which I would disagree in, in concept. This book is called The Way Nature Works. We handle it at the Creation Evidences Museum. Of course, we have a stamp inside which states that we do not agree with the evolutionary concepts. However, this book is filled with information more than any other single volume I've ever seen in 35 years of academic research on this subject, filled with information regarding the infrastructure of all of life systems. It would be very easy for a family studying the creation enterprise to see various ways that evolution has no explanation for what's going on. For instance, here is a special plant in the rainforest, and there's a special ant that makes his home inside that plant. That plant cannot live without the ant, and this particular ant cannot live well without the plant. The entire book is filled with the ecosphere, the environment, and all of nature as being orchestrated. And of course, it gives reference to the fact that nature is a wonderful orchestrator. It's a wonderful orchestrator only because a creator designed every single tenant. In this creation, leading up to the design an expression of God's image in man, there are some marvelously ingenious characteristics that are intrinsic to the very nature of life itself. For instance, animals can make and use tools. Chimpanzees use a stick or grass to fish termites. When water is not readily available, they chew leaves for a sponge and soak up 
the small amounts of water that would be available. The gorilla uses often a crooked stick to pull fruit closer to him. Elephants scratch their backs with sticks. The California sea otter uses a stone to crack the clam shells that is just retrieved from the bottom of the lagoon. Galapagos woodpecker finches use a stick to fish for grubs. The satin bower bird uses a paintbrush of bark to paint his bower. These are ingenious marks of design and ingenuity in the very innate nature of these creatures. Some animals even use medicine. Chimps ignore a leaf of Aspilia shrub until they're sick. But once they're sick, they chew this leaf. It kills disease-causing bacteria, fungi, and parasites. Pregnant elephants consume specific plants just before giving birth to the young. All of this is use of medication. The southwestern bears chew up roots of a particular plant, smear it on their paws and fur as an antibacterial insecticide. These creatures are wonderfully designed. One scientist enjoyed writing about a story. He was a researcher and had uh, or has a cabin off in the wilds where he goes on the weekends to get away from the pressure of his lab and his academic research. As he was leaving his cabin one Sunday afternoon to go back to the city, he decided to see how ingenious the local ants would be. So he took a tub and partially filled it with water, put a four-cornered stool in it in the water, and on top of the stool, he put a little saucer of chocolate. To make the task very difficult, he used a slow-drying glue and painted the outside of the tub. He smiled to himself and said, there's no way those ants can get to this. It was under his porch, and he decided to come back the next weekend. When he returned the following weekend, he found a very ingenious enterprise had taken place. The ants had sacrificed some of their own as they started up the glue. And in a single file, not in a mass mob throng, in single file, one ant after another had sacrificed his life to build a bridge over the glue. And then, once they passed the glue, other ants went all the way down to the inside of the tub. And then, they used various sticks and various grasses to build a raft. And it led as a bridge all the way to the leg of the stool. They climbed up and they were eating the chocolate. Other very venturesome ants had climbed up the interior of the ceiling of the porch, had calculated exactly where the chocolate was, and fell directly into their prize. Now that, in some respects, is more intelligent than I've observed individuals operating in the traffic of Dallas, Texas. I would say it takes some very special enterprise to do that. So we find some unusual characteristics in the animal world. Giraffes have a wonder net for blood at the base of their brain. You remember they have high necks and they have to bend over for water. Were it not for that wonder net, the pressure would throb in their brains and actually they would hemorrhage. But there's a wonder net that restricts the flow. In addition to that, they have a series of one-way valves working through the neck. In fact, an entire book was written, The Neck of the Giraffe, indicating that evolutionists have major problems. And one is the very neck of the giraffe itself. There's a lot of ingenuity going on. For instance, birds have a very sophisticated communication system. I mentioned that in the last lecture. Let me elucidate a little further and show you exactly how sophisticated some of these birds can be. There is a cowbird that often pairs with mates not within its immediate vicinity. There's a songless cowbird and some female songless cowbirds paired with some singing male cowbirds from another vicinity 
And their song was entirely different than that of the cowbirds of this immediate area. Yet, the male cowbirds that did the singing ended up singing the melody exactly like the local cowbirds sing. Now, the female companions had actually used flutters and brushes without ever uttering a sound to teach them to sing like the other fellows in the area sing. That's absolutely ingenious. That's an innate ability designed by the Creator Himself. Birds migrate by the use of the sun, internal clocks, star patterns, odors from pine trees, wind-generated low-frequency sound, pressure sensors in their middle ears, and magnetic field lines. Marvelous ingenuity in the creation. The little flea has intrigued my study in recent days. I don't care too much about fleas. I'm just trying to show you the ingenious design in all of nature. The little flea has springs that are powered in his joints. He releases five and a half times the energy that the most perfect muscle can generate through these little springs. Small pads of a natural protein, rubber, called resilin, in the legs. He slowly depresses the pads, stores the energy, and in one-seventh of the time it took him to store it, he can release it and thus jump tall buildings with a single bound. He's an incredible little creature. Now, other creatures are amazing. For instance, electric fish are aware of the geometry of their field, Smithsonian Magazine stated. They have receptors all over their bodies. To the shark, the ocean is a maze of electric signposts. Lobsters have half a million receptors on their bodies. They live in a universe continually surrounded by ever-changing chemical odors. Many animals, especially some insects, repeatedly sense a magnetic universe by means of ferromagnetic crystals in their brains. And some researchers have indicated that man also has small amounts of ferromagnetic material in his brain. This would indicate that when man's genetic expression was more optimal and man's ecosphere was more pristine, the pre-flood world, it could have been a paradise for man. In fact, I brought to the studio today an impact article from Institute for Creation Research talking about legends among the ancients in all parts of the world about a time in the past when man lived in greater bliss. For instance, Hesiod, around the 8th century BC, stated that the Kronos people lived like gods, carefree in their hearts, shielded from pain and misery. Helpless old age did not exist. They didn't sag, their limbs didn't sag with lack of vigor. A sleep like death subdued them, and every good thing was theirs. The barley giving earth asked for no toil to bring forth a rich and plentiful harvest. Man was suited for his environment, according to those legends. Now, it's been found by anthropologists and sociologists and historians that legends have a basis in fact. They may have been embellished, but they have a basis in fact. The Sumerians have a paradise myth. Ancient Egypt has a paradise myth in which there was plenty of food for the bellies of the people. No sand on earth. The crocodile did not cease prey. Now that is extremely interesting. The crocodile did not cease prey. The serpent did not bite. And everyone enjoyed blissful recreation together. In China, the great Taoist teacher Quang Si stated in the 4th century BC, the birds and the beast in the past multiplied to flocks and herds. The grass and trees grew luxuriant and long. The birds and beasts